when the once the resuscitation phase is ongoing, the main things that you have to see is that is my airway is paid and uh, is the child's need any respiratory support. So always prepare. If the child is getting uh, 40 ml per kg of fluids and also you are starting an inhaler, that means you are going down the line in, to the intubation. So always be prepared for the intubation. Next thing is that whether this child uh, need any other any other support from in terms of cardiovascular wise. So instead of giving other fluids, can I do I need a blood transfusion? If the if the patient is having a low or significant oxygen extraction, what I mean by oxygen extraction is your venous saturation are significantly low, like less than seventies, and while having a normal uh, normal saturation in the arterial veins arterial blood gases. And if your hemoglobin is less than 10, in a septic shock situation, they, you need to transfuse to your upper 10. There are a few controversies to say that, like what is the exact cutoff for according to the transfusion consensus. But for our setup, is that we are keeping it as 10 as a cutoff in a septic shock. And uh, anti ensure the antibodies are given. And the main thing at this point is that to look for other organ involvement as well. So quick check about the other organs as well, whether this, whether other organs also involved, whether sh should I support the other organs as well. So intubation is again, is exactly same as the dengue. While intubating this child, you can have a dramatic event and child even die. So a uh, competent, Operator have to intubate. So if you are not feeling comfortable, always get a help. It always even even get a help from the anesthetic team is is beneficial at that time. So what the drugs to use? Basically, before starting any induction agent, make sure my blood pressure is at least reasonably, at least in a reasonable amount. And I'm giving a fluid boluses in anticipation if you if it's really a marginal blood pressure, and also Make sure you started and started some inotropes if the child's marginal blood pressure, because the moment you are giving these vasodilators, child is going to collapse. And what's the drug of choice for the induction? As you said earlier in the day, it's ketamine is a drug of choice because it's not going to lower the blood pressure. And always use a low dose fentanyl versus the other medications because the propofol is going to be the vasodilator as well. So we hardly use the propofol or a not in the context of hypertension. Procuronium is again safe, but all these medications can cause vasodilation. So then there is a, if you have a metaraminol in a setup that you can keep the metaraminol, or otherwise you can have some ad diluted adenoline as one, one in 100,000 dilution, and you can give the small adequates if you have any uh, slight derangements of the blood pressures. So, you intubate and make sure that you are maintaining the blood pressures and you uh, and you take it from there. So, what are the what are the options for your inotropic support? So, as we said earlier, if it's a cold shock, give uh, start some no, adrenaline. You can even start the adrenaline peripherally. Don't worry. It's up like start from about 0 0.05 and you can try it. Right? But more increase the adrenaline dose. It goes for the constricted doses so that your peripheral lines may have to be really proximal or otherwise you need a central line if you need to increase the adrenaline more and more. So if it is a warm shock because of the vasoplegia, you need an inoconstrictor, the noradrenaline is a drug of choice. But if, you, but if your adrenaline is not working in that setup, you can add as a noradrenaline as a second agent. What about the dopamine? Dopamine can be used. There's still there are centers using a dopamine, but according to the adult studies and some pediatric studies, now the dopamine is not the first choice in a septic child. And uh, what about the other electrolytes? Calcium and magnesium and potassium are important in uh, important for the cardiac function. So make sure that you are normalizing those, but be careful of replacing the potassium because they are more prone to get the acute kidney injury. So they may be getting hyperkalemic. So be cautious with the potassium, but make sure that you give the calcium because calcium also is an inotrop. And uh, acidosis, don't try to treat acidosis in this context because that you have fluid and your uh, fluid replacement and the inotropic support 
once you make sure that the organ perfusion is improved, the acidosis will correct gradually. But if you are going into the line of fluid refractory shock, what are the options you can have in pediatrics, but evidence for the steroids are if you are suspecting an adrenal cortical insufficiency, then you can give some hydrocortisone. Otherwise, uh, in the start of a septic shock, there is no recommendations for the steroids. And, but if, if you are using everything, but it's not working, then you can think about uh, 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 hydrocortisone as a first cure. Don't avoid hyperglycemia, but don't treat the, uh, don't try to over treat the hyperglycemia because hypoglycemia is a detrimental in pediatric population. And uh, advanced therapies, right, renal replacement therapies uh, uh, can be used, uh, especially in the context of fluid uh, overload and the uh, acute kidney failure. But uh, removing the cytokines, uh, there is no convincing evidence. Immunoglobulins, again, inconclusive evidence. And ECMO support, if you have, you can use it. And blood products and the nutrition as you need it, you can use. And then, uh, so the other thing is the neonatal shock is basically that if you are having a you have to be really cautious and make sure you are actively looking for a congenital heart disease uh, and uh, it's treating HFV, uh, HSV infection or a paraco and retrovirus infection. And also inborn errors of metabolism also can present in a similar way. So main thing is if then if you're seeing a neonate, start some acyclovir as well as a septic, uh, one of the uh, uh, antimicrobial. And also make sure if you have an echo facility, do an echo to make sure that everything is fine. Okay. All right. That's the end of the lecture. In summary, make sure that you know the signs of symptoms of shock and uh, and remember the hypotension is a late sign and uh, make sure that you start the antibiotics less than uh, one hour of presentation and don't delay the uh, uh, any intervention just because you don't have an IV can go for intraocious lines and if it is infants uh, go for, do an echocardiograph that will be uh, a life-saving at times. Thank you. If you have any questions, uh, uh, if you have any questions, you can actually put in the chat box. Huh? Well, these are all recorded lectures. Uh, So we start this lecture again. Uh, so this is about uh, inotrox and immunosuppressors. Uh, basically, I have to discuss uh, very basic stuff uh, and uh, the rational views. Uh, so uh, this was the uh, inotropic, I would say, it's a pyramid, something like that, uh, that we had. Uh, when we are registrars and uh, sectors. So if you think that we need intros, initially we started dopamine. When the child is not responding, we think about dopamine, then adrenaline and adrenaline. So this is completely wrong because uh, they are different drugs. So you should select the drug depending on the clinical scenario. So this is the take message. Uh, they are not similar. There are immunodilators, there are restrictors. Uh, there are pure vasopressors, and the main action is dose dependent. Uh, so, good example is adrenaline. In low dose, it's a inodilator. In high dose, it's a inoconstrictor. So, you have to select the drug and the dose depending on the disease physiology. And uh, this is very important uh, 
concept when you are managing a critically ill child, don't forget about the big picture. So it's very common that when you are managing a very, very critically ill child, uh, we are concentrating more on one system. So the important thing is in here, uh, when you are when you think about the inotros, we are concentrating about the cardiovascular system. So yes, it is very important uh, system. But at the same time, don't forget this, this these children are having other systems also. So it's very important you know. whenever you are taking a decision, think about the whole body and take a decision rather than uh, take decisions for one compartment. So inotrope is an agent which increases or decreases the force of energy of muscular contraction. Negative lyotropic agent weaken the force of muscular contraction. Positive lyotropic agent will uh, increase the strength of muscular contraction. So you can't discuss about inotropes without this uh, Frank Starling curve. This is the cardiac output versus left ventricular endastolic volume. So usually it's a S-shaped curve. So uh, uh, what happens when you're starting an inotrope is that uh, you are increasing the contractility. So basically you are shifting this curve to left. So what does that curve mean? So this is my cardiac output versus left ventricular endastolic volume. So whenever you are increasing the left ventricular endastolic volume, your cardiac output increases. But at the same point of time, even though you are increasing the left ventricular endastolic volume, that is not preload, the cardiac output will not be increased. In fact, it will come down if you are increasing your left ventricular endastolic volume further. So this is the Frank Stalin curve. So what does what do you mean by this uh, shifting to the left means for the same amount of volume left ventricular endastolic volume now you are getting a better cardiac output that's why uh, that's what happens when you're starting in inotrope and if you decrease the contractility you are shifting this curve to right that means for the same endastolic volume now you're getting a lower cardiac output and if you increase the heart rate you shift to the left decrease the heart rate if you uh, you shift, uh, you, uh, shift this curve to the right. Right. So, inotrope will increase myocardial contractility. Pronotrope will increase your heart rate, and lucidrope will increase the diastolic relaxation. Now, again, think uh, what will happen to this. This is my Frank Stalin curve. So, if you are starting a lucidrope, that means it's a diastolic relaxate. So, during the diastole. The, your, left, your left ventricle will be relaxed more. That means more and more blood will accumulate in the left ventricle at the end of the diastole. That means more blood is available to be ejected during system. So that is what we mean by lucid drop. So it is important to discuss certain drugs. That's why I'm, I'm pointing this out now. So inotrope will affect the contraction of the muscle, especially the heart muscle. Entropic agent will increase the myocardial contractility. So these are the entropic agent. We have positive entropic agent. We have negative entropic agent. Positive entropic agent will increase the uh, the cardiac contractility. Digoxin, adrenaline, noradrenaline, dobutamine, dopamine, isoprenaline, all these things are uh, the positive entropic agent. And negative entropic agents are beta blockers and calcium channel blockers. And this concept also very very important to understand. So benefits. So uh, the, the idetro will improve the cardiac performance and improves the contractility of the myocardium and increase the blood pressure. That's the primary objective. So at the same time, think now uh, why we are starting idetro. Usually, in adults uh, population, we are starting idetro when your heart is failing. Why your heart is failing? The commonest reason for heart failure is ischemia. So due to ischemia heart cannot work more so cardiac output is low so we want to increase the cardiac output and you are starting inotrope so basically what you are doing is you are asking this failing heart to work more that's what you are increasing the cardiac contractility so that's what we are expecting so to work more this heart needs more oxygen more substrate but unfortunately, the initial problem was ischemia. So it's difficult to supply this oxygen and the substrate. So basically, by starting inotrope, you are increasing the ischemia. So demand is more, but supply is less. So that is not good at all. So risk is increased heart rate causing further deterioration of the failing heart pump. 
increase myocardial oxygen requirements, potentially arrhythmogenic, can increase ischemia. So that's the danger. Right. Then about vasopressors. Vasopressors are the, any agent that produces vasoconstriction and rising blood pressure. So nothing to do with the heart. You can constrict the vessel by using vasopressin or noradrenaline. So inodilators means inotropic vasodilator properties. Those will increase the flow. Like you think. So you are dilating the peripheral vessels. At the same time, you are increasing the cardiac activity. More forceful contractions. So blood will flow. Blood flow will increase through the organs. If you have any problem with the uh, organ flow, so this is the these are the drugs that you should start. Lobutamine, milnone. They are inodilators. Inoconstrictors. Uh, they have inotropic action with vasoconstriction properties. They will increase the perfusion pressure. Now again, think you are constricting the vessel, and you are asking the heart to work more. Contractility will increase. So most more forcefully, you are sending the blood through this constricted vessel. So your pressure is invariably going up. So if you want to increase the perfusion pressure, these are the drugs: dobutamine, adrenaline, adrenaline. So then about the Receptors. So these are adrenergic receptors. We have beta 1, beta 2, alpha 1, alpha 2, DA1 and DA2, and V1 and V2. I'm not going to go into details. So alpha agonist, alpha receptor agonist, ultimately causes vasoconstriction. Alpha 1 receptor. So alpha 1 receptors cause muscle contraction. There are so many other effects. I'm not going to go into detail. So mainly causes vasoconstriction. But alpha 2. Receptor agonist will cause vasodilatation. So other actions are also there. And beta uh, agonist have three main actions positively chronotropic, positively anthropic, and vasodilatation. So beta 1 receptors uh, stimulation will cause this positively chronotropic, inotropic, and ejection traction will increase. And beta 2 receptor causes smooth muscle relaxation. For example, you all know that common we are using salbutamol. So salbutamol will uh, it's a beta 2 receptor agonist. So smooth muscles will relax everywhere. So including bronchi, arteries, uterus, and everything. So you can use the ear of interest is dilating arteries, but in asthma of interest is dilating the bronchi, and uh, in uh, uh, pre pre preterm labor of interest is dilating the uterine muscle. So whatever it is, beta 2 receptor agonist will dilate your smooth muscle, relax your smooth muscle. So beta 1 uh, stimulation causes increased rate and force of muscle contraction, cardiac contraction. Beta 2 causes vasodilatation in the skeletal muscle. So dopamine receptors increase renal and coronary blood flow and arterial vasodilatation about 10 15 years of, of, uh, back as a belief that the dopamine uh, will stimulate the, the, the speed dopamine will increase the renal blood flow so we have, have uh, uh, something called renal dose of dopamine so nowadays people are not believing on that but that is the history right in summary these are the things that you have to remember so beta 1 receptor agonist, beta 1 receptor stimulation causes anotropic and chronotropic action. Beta 2 receptor stimulation causes vasodilatation. Alpha 1 stimulation causes vasoconstriction. Alpha 2 stimulation causes vasodilatation. DA1 and DA2 these are dopaminergic receptors, diuresis, naturesis, and vasodilatation. And B1 and B2, B1 causes vasoconstriction, B2 causes antidiuretic property. So this is vasopressin receptors. So if you think about the drugs, so dopamine will have beta 1, beta 2, alpha 1, DA1, and DA2. Nothing. Beta 1 causes inotropic action and chronotropic action. Beta 2, vasodilatation. With alpha 1, vasoconstriction. Nothing. Vasodilatation, vasoconstriction. So it's a bit confused. So whenever you are seeing this type of confusion, the high dose, usually any drug, will high dose will aim at alpha receptor, low dose will aim at beta receptor. So dopamine low dose is a dilator. We are stimulating the beta 2 receptor. Dopamine high dose is a constrictor. We are aiming at alpha 1 receptors. Dobutamine, beta 1, beta 2, minimum alpha. So beta 1, uh, the, uh, the entropic and chronotropic action, beta 2 vasodilatation. Minimum alpha 1 means 
minimum vasoconstriction. So it's a IMO dilator. Adrenaline, beta 1, beta 2, and alpha 1, beta 1, uh, anhydrotron drop, beta 2, vasodilatation, with, uh, alpha 1, vasoconstriction, again the confusion. So high dose alpha, low dose beta. Low dose adrenaline is a ino dilator, and high dose adrenaline is a ino constrictor. So adrenaline, alpha 1 and beta 1, minimum beta 2. So again, alpha 1, vasoconstriction, beta 1, anhydrotron and chronotron. Minimum beta 2, that means vasodilatation is minimal, so that's why it's a ino constrictor. B1 and B2 is a difference, and milling is a difference. So, same thing. So, we'll go one by one uh, with the drugs. Dopamine is a metabolic precursor of noradrenaline and adrenaline receptors D1, D2, alpha, beta 1, beta 2, and alpha. So, low infusion rates, 1 to 5 mics per kg is a vasodilatation. Intermediate intermediate uh, the, the intermediate dose is like five to ten mics per kg per minute, chronotropic and hydrotropic, and higher doses, ten to twenty mics per kg per minute, you are aiming at alpha receptors. So that means vaso constriction. So butamine already discussed beta one and beta two. Beta one causes increased contractility and uh, anhydrop and chronotrop, and beta two causes vasodilatation. So now think about the heart. So uh, the action of lobotomy is increase contractility, increase heart rate, and dilate the peripheral vessel. So that's a very good, uh, very good thing when you are considering a failing heart. But again, uh, uh, the commonest reason for heart failure in adults is ischemia. So lobotomy will increase the myocardial oxygen consumption. So lobotomy will increase the myocardial oxygen consumption. That means demand is more. The initial problem is lack of supply. Now this drug is asking more, so it can potentially uh, uh, increase ischemia and a lot of problems can happen. So it's not a very good drug. So it can cause tachycardia. It can cause dysrhythmia. It can uh, it can be associated with increased mortality in adult heart failure. And so routine use of dobutamine for heart failure has fallen out of play. Dobutamine is an Chronotrop vasodilator, but the increase in myocardial oxygen consumption. So uh, I, it's not an ideal drug. Adrenaline, okay, discussed. So beta one and beta two low doses, 0.01 to 0.02. So it's sinotrop, chronotrop, and beta two causes vasodilatation. So it's a ino dilator. In higher doses, uh, higher doses means above 0.1. Uh, micrograms per kg per minute. So 0.01 to 0.1 is low dose, above 0.1 is high dose. So higher doses, we are aiming at alpha receptors, uh, causes rates of constriction, and it will increase the systemic vascular resistance. So naturally, aiming at alpha 1 and beta 1. So inotrope, chronotrope, alpha 1 means phase of constriction. So uh, the basically, Minimum beta 2. So, okay, so dilatation is minimum. So it's an ino constrictor. So elevation of systemic vessel resistance is the ultimate uh, action. Right. So now again think about this. Now we are having problem with this patient. The blood pressure is low due to some reason. So we are worried about the blood pressure because low blood pressure causes low Perfusion with the vital organ. So mainly we want to improve the vital organ perfusion by increasing blood pressure. So you are starting noradrenaline. So noradrenaline is a vasoconstrictor. By constricting the vessels, you can increase the blood pressure. But what will happen to the circulation? So initially our, our worry is uh, the vital organ perfusion. So by vasoconstriction, even though you are increasing the blood pressure, your vital organ perfusion may be low. So renal perfusion, liver perfusion, and uh, brain perfusion may be low. So it's not a very good drug, even though numbers are good. So nurses are very happy, saying that initially blood pressure is very low. Now after starting medicine, now it is stabilized, the blood pressure is maintained. But as a doctor, as a sensible doctor, you should understand, OK, I have constricted the peripheral vessels. So my kidney, liver, skeletal muscles, mesenteric ventral, everywhere, now there's a vasoconstriction. So blood flow may be low. So it's not a very good thing to having low blood pressure, the high blood pressure or the normal blood pressure with uh, poor perfusion. So it's not a very good thing. So you can't have it. 
vasopressin so it's an endogenous parenteral form of anti diabetic hormone uh, this is uh, the physiology stuff produce and produce uh, the uh, produce at the supraortical paraventricular nuclei of the hypothalamus stored and released in the posterior pituitary gland it will uh, the rest in response to increased plasmaosmolar anti o as a baroreflex we can uh, then baroreflex mechanism uh, or decrease in blood pressure you are increasing the anti diuretic hormone of vasopressin so vasopressin will act on v1 and v2 receptors so v1 action causes significant waste transduction everywhere smooth muscle skin skeletal muscle fat pancreas thyroid gland yes git coronary vessels everywhere the massive waste transduction so you can increase the blood pressure by this so v2 receptor uh, stimulation causes increased water permeability permeability in the collecting duct that's why we are using that uh, vasopressin or the ADH in the diabetes inhibitors and it will increase the circulating concentration of procoagulant factor 7 and 1 milligram factor so that's why we are using in the upper GI bleeding and based on constriction of the mesenteric vasculature also will help uh, in managing upper GI bleeding so there's a place for upper GI bleeding and people thought okay uh, we are using adrenaline in cardiac arrest because we want to constrict the all the peripheral vessels and send some blood towards the heart so whoever the, uh, the resuscitator can massage the heart and send this blood uh, to the peripheral peripheral organs so that's the aim of using adrenaline in cardiac arrest people are most of the people in sri lanka are thinking that you start you are giving adrenaline to kick start the already stopped heart no so adrenaline we are giving a massive dose the aim of that dose is uh, possible vessel constriction through alpha receptor agonist. Then the peripheral vessels are constricted. Blood will come to the, uh, the towards the heart. So we can massage. We can do the resuscitation. So this blood will reach the peripheries. So that's the aim. So people think why you are using why you are using a high dose of adrenaline. Why can't you use a small dose of vasopressin instead? So vasopressin also will do the same thing. So exactly. So now it's in the guidelines. So we are using in the cardiac arrest, refractory hypertension and septic shock, recommended by American Heart Association as an alternative to epinephrine in adult patients with ventricular fibrillation. Vasopressin must be administered parenterally because it's declared by the trip stream in the GI. So now the new guidelines, APLS as well as the adult guidelines, they are having uh, the place for vasopressin uh, instead of, uh, instead of adrenaline. Right, so we have seen this uh, slide again uh, earlier also. Inotrop will increase the mass myocardial my contractility. Tronotrop will increase the heart rate. Lysotrop will increase the diastolic relaxation. So, this is the drug. So, it's a mildrenone phosphodiesterase inhibitor. It has everything inotrop, lysotrop, and mesodiabate. Nothing. So, lysotropic action means you are dilating your uh, diastolic, uh, during the diastole, you are dilating the the ventricle so during the diastole you are accumulating more blood towards the ventricle so during systole uh, it's inotrope so during systole you are contracting more forcefully so blood will eject from the heart more forcefully and you are dilating the vessel the, 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 the systemic vessels so the heart will find it easy to pump out blood so isotrope inotrope is dilate so you can't ask more from anybody when you are having a failing heart. So that's the best drug when you are treating a failing heart, like heart failure, myocarditis, uh, whatever the cause for heart failure. And the other important thing, it is doing this without increasing myocardial oxygen consumption of ventricular artery. So it should not increase the myocardial oxygen consumption like milliliter. So that's the best drug. Right, so this is the thing that you should know uh, uh, as a summary, so we are worried about either blood pressure or cardiac output. So you want to increase either blood pressure or cardiac output. So first we have to decide, okay, in my child, uh, whether I want to increase the cardiac output, whether I want to increase the blood pressure, whether I want to increase both, whether I want nothing. So if the blood pressure and cardiac output both are normal, you don't have to start anything. If the blood pressure is low, you have to increase blood pressure. 
with the cardiac output is low, we have to increase the cardiac output. With both are low, we have to increase both. So it's, there's no ma not, uh, the magic here. So it's a very simple thing. But clinically, as clinician, you have to assess your patient and come to a conclusion which uh, box my patient is in. So there are four boxes. You have to put your patient into one box. Then it's very simple. So if the blood pressure is normal, but the cardiac output is low, start low with mean and minimum. If the blood pressure is low, but the cardiac output is normal, you have to increase the blood pressure, start phenylephrine or dobutamine. If both are low, start two drugs, one to look after the cardiac output, and the one to look after the blood pressure. If both are normal, don't start anything. So that's very similar. So uh, adrenaline in cardiac arrest, uh, I have mentioned this. So dose is 0.1 ml per kg of 110,000 adrenaline. So that is 10 mics per kilo. It's a massive dose. So this is the only place that we are using. This is uh, here we are using one in 10,000 adrenaline. So, so as I mentioned, this that is a massive dose. The aim is vasoconstriction, massive vasoconstriction to send some blood towards the heart. Right. Then a little bit about specific diseases and epilepsies. I'm going to discuss in a minute. Uh, cold shock. Cold shock means peripheral shock. Now you have to remember. Why this there is a coldness? So, uh, when there is a shock, shock means inadequate tissue perfusion. When there is a shock, what body does is body tries to conserve whatever the uh, blood has. So, it will constrict all the peripheral vessels and send some blood towards the vital organs. That is why the coldness. So, this coldness is due to the shock. So, that due to the compensation of shock. So, body is trying to constrict this vessel and send some blood to the heart. So, if you try to forcefully dilate these vessels again, you can kill the child easily. So, during cold shock, your aim is not to dilate the uh, vessel, but to treat the pores. So, mainly it's fluid. So, cold shock may occur in dengue, cold shock may occur in uh, diarrhea, cold shock may be occur in any type of uh, hypovolume shock. So please don't start either for and try to dilate the peripheral vessels because it's a compensatory effect. The warm shock is a different thing. So warm shock, uh, uh, what happens is the shock is due to the vasodilatation. So warmness is due to vasodilatation. So shock is due to vasodilatation. So there are the treatment of shock is vasodilatation. I think you can understand the difference between the cold shock and warm shock. Cold shock. The coldness is an effect of shock. Warm shock is the cause for shock. So we have to treat the warmness or vasodilatation. So heart failure, already we have discussed. Best thing is, you know, you want uh, lysotropic action, you want uh, inotropic action, you want vasodilatation. Right to left shunt. So uh, I'm going to discuss in a minute, trace ICP, dengue. There's no place for inotropes in dengue. As I mentioned, it's a cold shock. It's always fluid, fluid, and fluid. So this is right to left shunt. So basically, Eisenwinkel syndrome. So this is the problem. So you have to send some blood from left to right. So what you can do, problem is here. If possible, dilate the pulmonary vessels. Give more fluid and constrict the uh, aorta or the constrict the uh, main vessels. So what you can do is you can use a base of press. Press ICP, its main aim is to maintain the adequate cerebral perfusion pressure. So this is the common cartoon. So uh, uh, cerebral perfusion will depend on the cerebral perfusion pressure. So cerebral perfusion pressure is MAP minus ICP, main arterial pressure minus ICP. So your mean arterial pressure should be high, your ICP should be low for you to get a good cerebral perfusion pressure. So how can you do that? To increase CPP, you can, you can increase uh, MAP, mean arterial pressure, by giving volume, inotrope and vasopressors. You can decrease your ICP by giving hypertonic saline, uh, mannitol, EVD, and training term. So you have to use high note constrictor. Right, so I thought I should touch upon anaphylaxis management because it's very, very important. 
So anaphylaxis is very, the management is very simple. You need only three things: airway, adrenaline, fluid. So any type of smallest hospital in Sri Lanka will have all these things. We have ambu bags, we have adrenaline, we have normal saline. So no child should die of anaphylaxis. So these are the drug doses: adrenaline, one in thousand. So this is the only condition that we are using: one in thousand adrenaline. The dose is 0 0.01 ml per kilo. 10 mics per kilo again, so that's the CPR dose. It's again a massive dose. So can repeat every five minutes. That's very important. There's no upper limit. So if the child is not responding, you have to give adrenaline every five minutes. If you want to nebulize, the nebulization dose is 5 ml. If you give if you want to give infusion, it's 0.1 to 5 mics per kg per minute. Remember, it's a massive dose in uh, in uh, other places, or they, usually we are starting 0 0.01 mics per kg per minute. Here is 0.1, so I told you 0.1. Over 0.1 is a vasoconstrictor dose. Here we have to start vasoconstrictor dose. Hydrodosome and up in the mid, not that important. So airway management, if the child is having a strido, you IM adrenaline, nebulize adrenaline, uh, should repeat if necessary, and IV hydrodosome. The child is having V's, nebulized adrenaline, salbutamol, amantrine infusion, IV hydrocosum. And at the end, we are going to get an ventilate if necessary. Circulation, if the child is in shock, adrenaline, IM, can be given every five minutes. So that's very important. There's no upper limit. If the child is not improving, please give adrenaline every five minutes. And fluid bolus is 20 ml per kilo, normal saline, can be repeated. Uh, if you want, you can start an adrenaline infusion. It should be a very high dose, like above 0.5. So basically, you need a central line. And if you want, you can start a noradrenaline infusion also. It's not in the guidelines, but if you know the physiology, you know that a noradrenaline, a small dose of noradrenaline will do the same thing. Right. So anaphylaxis, airway, breathing, circulation, disability, reassessment. And please don't hesitate to repeat adrenaline if necessary. So that's the key. So you can treat this. So I'm showing this. Uh, this is the uh, the Relaxes uh, management guideline published by the Association Council UK. So it's not my invention. Uh, I don't know if they can see. Adrenaline give IM unless experience with IV adrenaline. IM dose, one in thousand adrenaline uh, doses here. Repeat after five minutes if not. So there's no upper limit. It's always IM and dose uh, is uh, one in thousand. So one of the success stories, I'm always telling this because uh, then you will get some morale uh, up. So this is a 11 year old girl at that time. Uh, this, is, this happens about 10 years back. Uh, one of my good friend's daughter uh, presented to us with a severe anaphylactic shock. She is allergic to milk and uh, house milk. The saturation was 30% unrecordable blood pressure. She needed 35 ml per kg fluid. That is 15 doses of IAM adrenaline. This happens in LRHGTU and LRHMIC. So we had enough and uh, enough ability to put a central line and new adrenaline infusion, but we didn't uh, do that. We stick to the basics. Continuous nebulization with adrenaline and salbutamol, intubation and ventilation for eight hours, but she went back to school in three days. So that's the important. So this is her at that time. Now she is 21 years and studying in Canada. So take home messages. Uh, inotropes all are not similar. There are inodilators, there are inoconstrictors, there are vasopressors. And not only that, main action is dose dependent. Good example is adrenaline. Low dose is inodilator. High dose is inoconstrictor. So you have to select the drug and the dose depending on the disease physiology. So the, the conclusion, you have to make a hemodynamic diagnosis. Uh, no, point in, no point telling me uh, that child is having septic shock. But I want to know what is happening to the peripherals, whether the peripherals are cold or warm. If that is cold, I know already compensatory mechanisms are working. So I want to select the drug according. If the peripheries are warm, I know it's due to mental dilatation. That may be the reason for this. Sure. So I have to constrict the vessels, but something like that. So make a hemodynamic diagnosis, then optimum preload. So no point uh, starting uh, four or five inotropes without giving fluid. If the tank is not filled, you can't do this. And maintain perfusion pressure and flow. Both are important. No point having pressure without flow. No point having flow without pressure. So both are important. That's why very, very close monitoring is important. 
just because you asked me i started one night drops in the morning doesn't mean till tomorrow uh, the next day uh, what's wrong you have to continue the same minor drop so you have to evaluate this child time to time and uh, depending on the child's condition you may have to add minor drop you have to discontinue minor drop you want you may have to go up on one minor drop so this is my golden rule in particular yeah? sufficient is enough but the better is the enemy of good so don't try to do better things sufficient is enough so aim at sufficient blood pressure aim at sufficient cardiac output not better blood pressure and cardiac output because if you try to aim at better things you are causing uh, more trouble than good don't forget about the big picture because you are treating not only the heart not only the blood pressure you are treating a patient with kidney liver heart uh, brain and a lot of other organs so thank you very much so i'll try to answer the question that we have It's like uh, in uh, next 30 minutes or so, we will try to uh, discuss a sim simplicistic approach uh, to interpret the arterial blood gas. So, um, the outline of my lecture is uh, this introduction uh, about what I'm going to do and the, the steps of actually interpreting uh, blood gases. And we will do um, at least about two cases uh, if the time permits. Right. So this lecture, when we talk about the, uh, the arterial blood gas interpretation, uh, I mean, the, the extent of uh, which that we can discuss is enormous. Uh, so many things to discuss. Uh, and, uh, and actually, uh, the, the things that, that is tested uh, in this sort of a, a topic in your exam may be slightly different from clinical practice. So I'm, what I'm trying to do is, uh, 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 give you uh, certain skills and the details where uh, you can get a uh, uh, insight into how to clinically interpret uh, a blood gas. So you need to read a lot more um, and if you want to sort of you know answer an exam question based on um, uh, arterial blood gas and it, it's beyond this lecture uh, and then at the same time uh because you guys are registrars just wanted to tell you that uh, there is a difference between uh, reporting versus interpretation so i'm i'm actually uh, uh, highlighting this issue at the inception uh, reporting is uh, say for example you do a blood gas uh, in, a, in a patient and then you will see um, uh, i have done a blood gas ph is 7.2 carbon dioxide is 70 PAO2 is 60, bicarbonate is this and that. Uh, and, uh, and you know that the listener uh, on the other side of the phone or, or at the bedside cannot actually manage a patient by just hearing to that because that, that's, that is just a reporting of uh, a, a, 
uh, blood gas and its values interpretation is uh, slightly more different uh, with interpretation you should be able to manage the patient so therefore uh, it's not only just telling the parameters of the blood gas maybe deranged maybe normal but uh, but of, of course uh, synthesizing and intermingling it with the uh, uh, clinical picture so interpretation is not just uh, looking at the blood gas report and its values and their derangements but uh, but of course uh, it's a uh, it, and correlating them with the clinical picture as well so uh, throughout this lecture we are actually uh, trying to trying to uh, uh, highlight this issue of reporting versus uh, interpretation okay so anatomy of a blood gas report i think almost uh, all of you must have seen a blood gas report and uh, and the blood gas report varies with uh, the with, with, with the blood gas machine and this is the blood gas machine we have uh, and you can see there are um, uh, many parameters available and and mind you uh, only some of these parameters are actually clinically uh, useful uh, right so um, these parameters again i have to say that depends on the machine and some machines are very basic so they will give you only few uh, um, of these uh, uh, parameters but some machines are advanced um, so they will give more um, uh, parameters and if you if you look at the blood gas the first thing is that uh, these parameters are arranged in, uh, in into two uh, areas and the first area is is actually uh, limited to measured parameters so of course some of the parameters are actually measured by the machine and and you can see that the next uh, uh, group is actually calculated from uh, these measured ones so so you need to know whether these are actually a measured ones or or, or calculated ones say for example a classical example is uh, now now i don't know whether i can uh, show it in this blood gas yes you can uh, i can uh, now you can see the saturation here is actually a measured one so so this blood gas machine actually measures saturation but in most of the blood gas machines available in sri lanka uh, this, this is of course a blood gas machine in sri lanka but but most of the blood gas machines uh, the saturation will come here because uh, the saturation is a calculated parameter based on pao2 so in that circumstance your saturation here depends on the pao2 so it might not actually uh, be the correct and actual saturation because uh, because the machine actually uh, put it into an algorithm based on uh, 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 um, oxygen dissociation curve and then actually calculate the saturation. So so basically, uh, remember there are two types of uh, two groups of parameters. Some are measured and some are calculated, and it's interesting to know which one is which. Um, then. Um, uh, the other at, at, the, at the same time i need to tell you that uh, when, whenever you uh, trying to interpret a blood gas and then manage a patient uh, using the blood gas or, or depending on the parameters of the blood gas so remember that uh, these are tests and in, like any test there, there are there could be problems of accuracy so accuracy could be because of a sampling issue say for example you try to sample and uh, and if you want to sort of you know prove yourself that you can do a blood gas uh, but actually you are unable to sometimes what happen is you take you take drops of blood into the um, blood gas syringe and then put it into the blood gas machine and we have done this uh, as trainees uh, when we are pressed to you know um, uh, according to the clinical situation and we have seen this uh, the trainees are doing so if that is the case, uh, actual values that you get might not actually uh, correct uh, because there may be a lot of uh, interaction with the environment when you do that. Uh, and then the transport, uh, uh, you have to you have to you have to use this blood gas as soon as you sample or you, or you have to store it in a uh, in in appropriate way. Um, and also it depends on the machine now if in this example you can see that there are a lot of question marks and say uc uc is uncalibrated so whenever you see this say this the 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 values may not be uh, actually accurate right so uh, interpretation of uh, uh, blood gas like uh, like in any other critical care approach uh, 
uh, has a structured approach. So um, if you look at uh, different books and different uh, lectures and, and look into different people, and they may be saying different steps, but, uh, but uh, th this is how I uh, usually teach. So I usually advocate seven steps. So the first step of looking at a blood gas is, is looking at the pH. So remember, pH is a um, measured parameter. So the second second thing that you uh, after looking at the pH is uh, if the pH is deranged, uh, who causes this derangement? So for, to do that, you need to look into carbon dioxide bicarbonate and uh, and the base excess or base deficit. Um, then thirdly, uh, when you establish that there is a derangement uh, in the acid base status, status, the third thing that you need to look into is whether there is any compensation and we will come to that um, uh, in the next coming slides. Um, then fourthly, uh, if there is a problem, uh, uh, you try to do certain things uh, using the blood gas itself mostly uh, or, or using other uh, uh, investigations to narrow down your differential diagnosis. So say, for example, metabolic acidosis, you, you try to calculate anion gap and, and see whether your metabolic acidosis is non-anion gap metabolic acidosis or high anion gap metabolic acidosis. So your differential di diagnosis is narrow if, if you can uh, come to a conclusion. And for uh, metabolic alkalosis, uh, you might calculate urinary, you might measure urinary uh, chloride. And depending on the urinary chloride, you can uh, uh, classify uh, it into either chloride responsive or chloride resistance uh, kind of uh, metabolic alkalosis. Uh, then the fifth step is actually take all these things and have a acid based diagnosis complete acid based diagnosis and sixth uh, and some um, actually advocate this as the first step so you need to look at uh, oxygen and and other parameters so out of the other parameters i think oxygen and and it its surrogates are, um, uh, are, are one of the most important parameters in, in the sheet um, then last but not the least important step uh, uh, is to arrive at a clinical diagnosis. So to do this, you have to have a base diagnosis and, and you need to include other parameters including oxygen. And, uh, and also you need to know certain things about the uh, clinical background and the current clinical uh, picture um, of, the, of the child or, 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 the, or, or the patient. Right. Okay. So let's go into these these steps uh, one by one. And uh, before I look into the first step, uh, usually you do a blood gas uh, uh, to find out something. I mean, you, you won't just do a blood gas and 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 see something and then you know try to act upon it. But but uh, you, you do it. Uh, uh, with a purpose so you, you know you should know the clinical background why you are doing it and and what you are looking for so what you are expecting uh, uh, before getting into any of these uh, structured uh, uh, steps so first step uh, you look at the ph so depending on the ph uh, uh, you, you could get either a normal um, um, pH, you can get uh, pH less than 7.35, we call it acidemic uh, pH, or you can get um, a, a value exceeding 7.45 and we call it um, alkalemic uh, sample. But remember, um, uh, so if the pH is less than 7.35, some call it acidosis. And if this is more than 7.45, uh, some call it alkalosis. But but I think the actual or the correct term is acidemia and alkalemia, uh, depending on the pH. Uh, and there is a reason why I am stressing this because the, because the patient could still be acidotic or alkalotic without being acidemic. Say, for example, a person who is acidotic uh, can have normal pH, and I will come to that uh, in next uh, couple of slides. So. So the patient is actually having an acidosis, but is not acidemic. So um, uh, uh, understanding these terms is therefore uh, a bit important. So the second thing, if um, if you have any uh, issues with the pH is to identify 
uh, who is causing this and to do that uh, you look at carbon dioxide, you look at bicarbonate, and you look at uh, base deficit or base excess. And uh, normal carbon dioxide, as you know, is between 35 to 45, and anything above 45 uh, is hypercarbic. And we know that uh, if a patient is hypercarbic, uh, you need to look into dope as minimum. So dope is dislodgement, obstruction, a pneumothorax, or equip equipment failure, and this is for a ventilated child. Um, and or the patient may be hypocarbic uh, uh, if it is less than 35. And in certain interpretations, uh, rather than having a range, and you will get a one value uh, or the cutoff point. And cut if if you if you are taking a cutoff point for an interpretation, cutoff point would be 40. So in in that circumstances, anything below 40 is uh, hypocarbic. Anything above uh, 40 is uh, hypercarbic. Then bicarbonate, uh, the normal range is between 22 to 26. And uh, depending on the textbooks, this may vary slightly uh, and it's not very important. Um, and uh, and the base deficit, uh, what, what, what is inside these uh, parentheses are actually base deficit. So base deficit or base excess has a range. It may be from plus two to minus two. So this is the normal range. And uh, hypercarbia is when it is more than 26 or when the base deficit is more than two, base excess or base deficit is more than two, uh, base excess is more than two. And uh, and when it is when it is less than twenty two, if our cabinet is low, and in that in that circumstances, the patient will have a, have a base deficit. So um, just to tell you certain things about uh, this base excess and the base deficit and the bicarbonate, and if you look at the blood gas report here. Uh, so blood gas report, you can see base excess is expressed as base excess ECF and base excess blood. And bicarbonate is expressed as standard bicarbonate, SBC is standard bicarbonate and, and uh, actual bicarbonate. So let's look into uh, what these terms actually tell you. So what is uh, base excess? So base excess is the amount of strong acid uh, that must be added to each liter of blood to return the pH to. Uh, 7.40 uh, at standard conditions. So uh, base excess means uh, there is more base. So you need to add strong acid uh, to the to, to get the pH back to normal. Uh, and the definition of usually expressed at standard conditions. And what are these standard conditions? Uh, when the blood is fully oxygenated, uh, where the saturation is 100% and the PaO2 is around 100 and when the temperature is 37 and the carbon dioxide is standardized to 40. So, uh, so that is uh, what we call the uh, base excess, um, uh, base excess. Then uh, base excess blood and what are base excess ECA? So base excess blood or actual uh, base excess is, uh, is the base excess as it uh, explains. Uh, but base excess ECF is uh, this. Now, when we talk about base excess, we said amount of strong acid that must be added to each liter of blood. Now, here, rather than each liter of blood, you, you take each liter of extracellular fluid. So that is what is meant by base excess ECF. Why there is a difference? Uh, because extracellular fluid has two components in the bit. So it has blood or intravascular component as well as uh, uh, interstitial uh, component. So why there is a difference? Difference is from um, the presence of hemoglobin. Now, when you talk about blood, there is hemoglobin concentration is high. Now, remember, hemoglobin is a buffer. Uh, when we talk about ECF, uh, now hemoglobin is concentrated in the intravascular component, but there is no hemoglobin um, uh, in the interstitial space. So when we talk about B B base excess ECF, blood gas machine, even out this hemoglobin, which is available inside the intravascular compartment, throughout the extracellular compartment. So usually, usual algorithm is that it will assume when, when this occurs, the, the hemoglobin is about five grams per deciliter. So uh, you may be having hemoglobin of 10 grams in, inside the blood, but if this blood 
is actually distributed all over the extracellular uh, fluid compartment then, then the machine assumes that the hemoglobin is about five grams and and then it calculates the uh, base excess easier so this is what we call the uh, 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 base excess easier so the, these two will have slightly different values therefore and uh, carb bicarbonate i said there are two uh, ways of expressing uh, standard bicarbonate and actual bicarbonate and standard bicarbonate is uh, uh, is bicarbonate uh, calculated uh, now bicarbonate is a calculated value and is standard bicarbonate is bicarbonate calculated when uh, whenever there is standard condition so what are these standard conditions when the carbon dioxide is 40 and when the oxygen is 100 and when the temperature is 37 and actual bicarbonate as the name uh, implies it's the actual amount amount of bicarbonate uh, without uh, um, uh, correcting it for the standard conditions right so uh, so if you have looked in look at the th three possibilities it could be normal it could be um, uh, acidic or it could be alkalemic uh, then you look at you looked at the carbon dioxide and the bicarbonate and now you should be able to tell if the pH is deranged, who is causing uh, this derangement? Say, for example, um, if there is acidosis, and if, when you look at the carbon dioxide, if the carbon dioxide is high, then you know that uh, that is a respiratory acidosis. And uh, if there is alkalosis, and when you look at the bicarbonate, if the bicarbonate is high, then you know that it's a uh, metabolic alkalosis. And at this moment of time, it's important to tell you. Uh, the third possibility and sometimes you may have been have have a normal ph in the blood test so just don't uh, uh, ignore the other parameters if the ph is normal because a normal ph uh, can occur in the presence of two abnormal uh, processes and this is this is what i explained earlier why uh, the definition of uh, um, as al alkalemia and acidemia uh, as opposed to uh, acidosis and alkalosis is important say for example if a patient is having a metabolic acidosis which is balanced by metabolic uh, or respiratory alkalosis then the patient potentially can have normal ph but very abnormal um, bicarbonate and the carbon dioxide so if even if you see normal ph don't uh, 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 just ignore carbon dioxide and bicarbonate always look at the carbon dioxide and bicarbonate if the bicarbonate and the carbon dioxide both are normal in the presence of normal ph you can put it down as normal uh, but if these two are abnormal if one of these is abnormal you know that the other one is also abnormal it has to be abnormal and uh, and and then you have two opposing processes uh, uh, rather than uh, having a normal pH. And at this moment of time, and we'll come to that later on, um, I just wanted to highlight that a compensatory process will never ever make the pH normal. Right? So that is the current consensus uh, of uh, most of the authorities in, um, uh, in, in blood gases. Right, so uh, let's talk third step so first step is look at the ph the second step is looking at the carbon dioxide bicarbonate and base deficit and the third step is uh, is looking at the compensation so uh, remember any respiratory abnormality will be compensated by a metabolic process and the metabolic abnormality will be um, compensated by a respiratory process say for example patient is having a metabolic acidosis now ph is deranged so ph has gone down now the body is trying to get the ph as normal as possible and to do that the, the patient's respiratory drive will increase so respiratory rate will increase depth might increase um and that will cause uh, the washing out of the carbon dioxide so ultimately ph will be nearly normalized not not completely uh, normalize again I'm, I'm highlighting that the compensation will never ever normalize uh, the ph so um so see, remember respiratory acidosis is uh, 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 is compensated by a met by uh, retaining the bicarbonate alkalosis uh, by eliminating the bicarbonate and metabolic acidosis by key, uh, washing out the carbon dioxide and metabolic alkalosis by um, uh, keeping the carbon dioxide and usually 
uh, metabolic processes will be compensated uh, quite quickly because the respiratory system is very efficient in washing out carbon dioxide or keeping carbon dioxide but uh, but the respiratory process will not be um, uh, compensated that rapidly because kidneys take some time either to retain bicarbonate or uh, eliminate bicarbonate right so in in this patient uh, this is what i highlighted earlier now you can see the ph is normal 4 5 and the carbon dioxide is 78 70 and the uh, bicarbonate is 48 so this patient uh, although having um, uh, high carbon dioxide and uh, high bicarbonate has normal ph because these are two uh, opposing uh, disorders so this patient is having a mixed disorder um, this patient is having respiratory acidosis and uh, and um, uh, metabolic alkalosis rather than uh, either respiratory acidosis compensated by uh, metabolic alkalosis or uh, compensated by metabolic process or metabolic alkalosis compensated by respiratory process because the pH is normal. Right. So when we talk about compensation, normally we don't uh, use these formulas uh, in clinical practice, but uh, they, they, there are ways of uh, calculating expected compensation. So if the patient is not having uh, expected compensation, uh, uh, you can say that there is an additional uh, process going on. Um, and for metabolic acidosis, this is the formula, and for metabolic alkalosis, uh, this. Um, and there are different formulas for respiratory acidosis and respiratory alkalosis, as well as uh, these formulas will differ uh, each process into acute and chronic. And this is actually called uh, one, two, four, five uh, rule as well, because you can see that uh, th there are factors of one two four and five so i'm not i'm not going to sort of you know go into details about this because this is very uh, uh confusing if i try to explain this uh, within this short time period but uh, but see these and and go through this and see whether you can uh, uh, work out how uh, these things are uh, calculated now i said uh, uh, earlier in certain situations, uh, you take cutoff point than the um, uh, than the range. Now, this is a situation where you take the cutoff point. Now, this 40 is actually the carbon dioxide. So this is the cutoff point and this 24 is the uh, bicarbonate level uh, rather than 22 to 20, 26, you have get the cutoff point of 24. So these formulas actually using cutoff points rather than um, uh, 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 reference ranges so go through this and and, and they try to work out uh, expected compensations and and you might uh, um, uh, use this in couple of blood gases that is from your unit uh, when, whenever you go to the unit and see how you can use it but largely these are uh, not very relevant in clinical practice um rather this is very relevant in clinical practice uh, so this is the fourth step uh, whenever you have metabolic acidosis, then you need to calculate the anion gap. So anion gap is actually uh, sodium minus chloride minus bicarbonate. And range is 8 to 16. And again, the cutoff point is 12. And usually when we talk about high anion gap, usually you have anion gap more than 20s usually. And uh, normal anion gap. Uh, is anything between um, uh, 8 to 16. So your, uh, your, your anion gap acidosis can be uh, classified into um, high anion gap and a normal anion gap. Uh, so it's, there are some examples here. Uh, I think there are um, uh, many ways of remembering uh, this high anion gap and the normal anion gap. And, and uh, one of the ways is to apply the neonium uh, mud plies. Uh, for high anion gap metabolic acidosis and how you get uh, uh, anion gap is uh, is explained there by this picture um, and you can see this is normal plasma um, and this is the major cation which is sodium and uh, there are certain uh, 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 major anions so these are the ones that we normally measure uh, but there are certain things that we don't measure uh, so ide ideally your anion anions should uh, match the cations uh, but because the 
the, um, the 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 differences between the measured ones and the unmeasured ones you get this difference um and uh, and this is an example for acidosis with no gap so there is no gap here and there is an acidosis uh, with a gap you can see it. so this is the normal uh, and, and this is again there is acidosis but there is this this gap is normal and and here uh, this is a high anion gap metabolic acidosis so there is uh, there is a significant gap and i i hope you can understand uh, this uh, physiological picture by looking at this uh, graph sorry so um uh, when we talk about anion gap there is a there is another term uh, usually expressed uh, uh, in physiology books and this is called delta ratio and uh, delta ratio is actually the uh, is the ratio between uh, the change in the anion gap so normal anion gap is considered as 12 again a situation where you take the cutoff point uh, rather than the reference range so change in the anion gap from 12 and this is, this is only for the high anion gap metabolic acidosis. So say if your anion gap is 25, so your change is 13. And, uh, uh, and the change in the bicarbonate, again, you, get, you take the cutoff point as 24 in this situation. So normal bi bicarbonate is 24. So um, uh, depending on the, um, uh, depending on the, um, uh, situation you, you you can get you can get certain values and usual ranges between one to two and if it is more than two uh there is high anion gap acidosis with pre-existing metabolic acidosis so if if this is uh, slightly lower so there may be another type of uh, uh, metabolic acidosis in addition to the high anion gap right so um uh, then for the metabolic acidosis, I said uh, you need to look at the urinary chloride. So it could be less than 20 or more than 20. Uh, so you can uh, refer to any standard textbooks uh, to get uh, conditions. What are the conditions who has less uh, uh, chloride responsive metabolic acidosis and who, got, uh, who can get more um, uh, chlorides. Um, then the fifth step is, uh, as I said, uh, to have an acid-based diagnosis. So uh, whenever you have acid-based diagnosis, there are certain components that you need to include in it and what sort of acidosis and severity, whether there is a compensation, and then gap, gap, gap or chloride depending on the, uh, uh, the type of derangement, chronic or acute uh, in case of respiratory. So example, severe high anion uh, gap metabolic acidosis with uh, respiratory compensation. Right, so sixth step uh, uh, is on oxygen. So there are many ways that the um, that you can get an idea about oxygen in the in the blood gas. And one of the one of the simplest ways is, uh, is look at the PaO2. Uh, but always uh, look at the PaO2 in the context of FiO2. Uh, uh, that is, if you know the FiO2. Uh, so which means that uh, you are referring to PF ratio than just the PaO2 because you, I, I think you, you already know that uh, your PaO2 will depend on the FiO2. So you can have the same PaO2 with less FiO2 and high FiO2. So if you don't look into the amount of oxygen given to achieve that PaO2, so you might get a, uh, you might see a result uh, which might not actually uh, reflect in the patient's clinical picture. Um, then you might have a saturation, and this is usually a calculated value in most machines, ex with some exceptions. Uh, so this will really depend on the PaO2. Um, and then you have what we call the AA difference or and, and AA ratios, um, and we will come to that in the next slide. And and also you can have surrogates of uh, of oxygenation like lactate. Right. So. Uh, when we talk about oxygen, uh, remember that there are um, uh, certain things that you need to realize and, and there is a thing called oxygen content in the blood. 
So oxygen content uh, has two components, oxygen attached to hemoglobin, oxygen attached, at, uh, oxygen dissolved in the blood. Actually, the PaO2 only uh, give you an idea about dissolved hemoglobin. So um, dissolved hemoglobin carries less oxygen compared to oxygen attached to hemoglobin. And also very important to uh, realize that uh, oxygen is meant to deliver to the tissues rather than be there. So you can have good oxygen in the blood, but still your tissues might uh, starve. So whenever you look at the blood gas, remember you, you need to look into the oxygen delivery and also oxygen utilization as well. Say for example, um, uh, you will try to increase the ventilatory settings, ventilatory pressures to achieve good oxygen in the blood, but this will actually reduce the venous return and uh, reduce the cardiac output as a result. So you will have good amount of oxygen in the blood or adequate amount of oxygen in the blood, but because of the reduced cardiac output, this might not get delivered to the tissues. So hypoxia uh, versus hypoxemia. So hypoxia is actually less oxygen in the tissues and hypoxemia is actually uh, less, less oxygen in the blood. So PaO2. Uh, versus actually tissue actual tissue hypoxia um, and in, a, in the blood gas we normally measure the hypoxemia so there are several ways of measuring hypoxemia it's uh, by looking at the pao to pf ratios a, a difference uh, a, a gap uh, and and what we call respiratory index so a gap is uh, arterial oxygen tension divided by the alveolar oxygen tension respiratory index is the aa gap divided by pao2 um, the difference between these two uh, uh, from aa is that these two is less affected by fio2 and the um, uh, barometric pressure so uh, it's less change but uh, in clinical practice none of these are uh, none of these three are uh, important right um, uh, so um, I, just to highlight uh, um, uh, of, of some errors that you might uh, uh, get into whenever you look at uh, uh, these values. So this, 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 this is a, these are gases uh, of a patient and the on admission arrival at ICU and, uh, and, and after intubation. So just look at a few things. Uh, you can see the PAO2. <laughs> If I use it, of course, that's one up and carbon dioxide almost the same. Um, and because the FIO2 has gone up, uh, you can see that the pH ratio initially has increased, so which indicates that uh, to the amount of FIO2, PAO2 is higher uh, uh, on ad, rather than when we can on admission to the uh, uh, intubation. But look at this A gradient. So A gradient has increased. So if you just look at the A gradient, you might think that uh, this patient is uh, worsening, but this patient is not actually worsening. This patient is um, uh, really getting better um, or, or maybe at least the same. Uh, if you look at the respiratory index, it's almost the same because these doesn't get affected by the FiO2 and uh, and the A ratio again remains the same because it is not getting affected by the FiO ratio. And the reason why this A gradient has increased is uh, because of this FiO2. And also this A gradient can be affected by the carbon dioxide as well. So remember, whenever you, you looking look into these parameters and think about uh, uh, the other things that can affect uh, their value. Um, so, seventh step, uh, the, which is the most important and uh, uh, which is the interpretation um, or, uh, of all these values uh, synthesizing with the clinical picture. Um, and this is very important if you want to treat the patient uh, rather than the ventilator or the, or the blood gas report. So, seventh uh, uh, step is one of the most important steps uh, uh, from one to seven. So I discuss this. And if you want to uh, um, uh, study more on the blood gas, I think there are uh, two free um, uh, important websites. And one is Life in the Fast Lane. I hope you all know about this. And one is the Deranged Physiology. And uh, these will explain certain things uh, uh, according to previous exam questions. So these exam questions are basically critical medicine uh, kind of uh, exam questions. So um, uh, uh, 
uh, and out of the blood gases they will identify the exam questions that were targeting this blood gas blood gas topic uh, and they explain certain things uh, uh, using that so these these, these two, two are very good uh, blood gas report and there is an article if you put interpretation of arterial blood gas results plus bmj in the bmj in the uh, google search uh, you will get this article. It's a good article. And for uh, emergency medicine, there is a there is a website called Emcrit uh, that is also a good site to further study uh, blood gases. So just to highlight what I told you uh, uh, in two cases. So the first case, six month old uh, pneumonia patient on high flow oxygen, and uh, who is on two liters of uh, two liters per kg of oxygen with a uh, FiO2 of ninety percent and uh, heart rate is 170 and respiratory rate is 60 and if you look at the blood gas you can see that the ph is normal and the carbon dioxide seems to be normal and pao2 is 90 and uh, and the bicarbonate is 24 and this deficit is minus one so if you uh, i i said whenever you look at the blood gas whenever you are doing a blood gas think uh, uh, about the clinical picture of the patient and think what you expect uh, in this patient. So this is a six month old pneumonia patient on high flow and the patient is having a very high respiratory rate, which means the minute volume in the ventilation is high. So you expect these patients to have a kind of alkalotic uh, uh, picture because they normally wash out uh, uh, carbon dioxide. That's the normal picture in, in pediatric patients. So in this patient, Sorry, uh, in this patient, pH is normal, carbon dioxide is normal, and uh, PO2 seems to be normal. But if you uh, look at the PF ratio, it's about 100, um, uh, so low PF ratio. And uh, you expect this child to have an alkalotic pH, but uh, but this child is not so big. You'll be very worried about this child because this child may be having impending respiratory failure. So you need to go and evaluate this child again uh, uh, about uh, impending respiratory failure based on this uh, carbon dioxide alone so remember when you evaluate the respiratory uh, uh, distress in a child you look at three things one is the effort so this child is having high effort next thing is the efficacy so efficacy is uh, uh, what you expect from this high respiratory rate uh, and the respiratory distress which is not there and the third thing is the effects and you can see that uh, uh, effects of uh, uh, this respiratory failure is already starting. Heart rate is high. I haven't given the other parameters here. Okay, case two, two months poor fading for one day, and this is the heart rate uh, uh, and this is the blood pressure. And looking at the hemodynamic parameters, you can you can see that this child is in uh, in a kind of compensated shock. And when you look at the blood gas, uh, acidotic um, and bicarbonate is low, and the lactate is high. So acidemic pH uh, and who is causing this? This is the metabolic acidosis and whenever you have a metabolic acidosis you need to look at the uh, anion gap. So anion gap is 20 so which which means uh, you have to look into mud flies and and look at the lactate. Lactate is high so this patient is having lactic acidosis uh, uh, and which is compensated uh, actually uh, with the reduction in the carbon dioxide. So this patient is actually having compensated uh, shock or most likely sepsis. So it requires uh, cardiovascular support. Right, so um, uh, that reaches to the end of uh, this lecture. Um, so in summary, uh, whenever you do a blood gas, do not treat the blood gas, but treat the patient. So know why you are doing the gas and think of the expected findings. Um, and to do this, you need to have a blood gas interpretation uh, together with uh, uh, clinical correlation and have a structured approach uh, because if you have a structured approach, you won't miss uh, certain things. And also remember that many things can change uh, the um, uh, blood gas. So you can have sampling errors, you can have machine errors, etc. So always compensate for uh, these things. Thank you. Yeah, so I will answer a couple of questions. Uh, uh, one question is how accurate venous PCO2 uh, can be uh, when you used it in uh, calculations uh, comparative to arterial PCO2. Um, so uh, I um, whenever you uh, use venous carbon dioxide, you should know that it can change 
from about five from the uh, arterial gas. So um, when you take it uh, as a single value, it might not actually reflect uh, 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 the actual picture. So so don't don't uh, replace arterial carbon dioxide with venous carbon dioxide if you're just looking at a single value. But if you want to sort of you know um, um, uh, uh, do serial things and uh, and uh, and then and then see the serial changes. Uh, of course, you can take, uh, you can you can surrogate car uh, arterial carbon dioxide from. There will be half an hour tea break. Uh, once again, the lectures will be started at 11 a.m.
So we'll be discussing about, or uh, we'll be over the next uh, probably 20 minutes or so, we'll be discussing about a uh, convulsing child. So we'll be discussing about Yeah, so just to understand pragmatic approach to a child with convulsive status epilepticus, uh, to understand the protocol for the treatment of a child with convulsive status epilepticus, and to introduce the drugs which we could use in Sri Lanka. Sorry, I didn't introduce myself. I'm Dr. Sanjay Fernando, the pediatric neurologist at Colombo North Teaching Hospital and the National Hospital of Sri Lanka. So there is a difference between a conversion. Is there a difference between a conversion, a seizure, and a fit? So conversion is a seizure itself, but to call it a conversion, there should be a certain amount of motor activity. This motor activity could be a sustained motor activity like in a tonic seizure or an interrupted motor activity like in a clonic, uh, clonic seizure or a tonic-clonic seizure. So fit is, fit is a term which is being used by the, the lay people. So kind of, you know, non-medics. So we'll try to avoid the word fit as much as possible. So we'll discuss about the convulsive, uh, 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 convulsing child. So the definition, which has evolved over the time, but still to date, uh, up to date, it's a, a continuous generalized conversion, a motor activity, which is going to last for more than 30 minutes. Or repeated attacks, repeated conversions without regaining the uh, the full without regaining uh, the full consciousness between the seizures or without full recovery between the seizures and there are these uh, five minutes and 30 minutes so we are supposed to act uh, we are supposed to give medication whatever the rescue medication that we are going to give we'll be discussing about the rescue medication uh, over the next few slides and even though the definition is 30 minutes for a status epilepticus, we are supposed to start rescue medication by five minutes. So, but why? What's the difference between these five and 30? So another slide to depict the same uh, scenario. So we, there is T1, time one, when a seizure is likely to be prolonged leading to continuous seizure activity. In other words, if you're not going to treat, if you're not, if you're not going to act upon by uh, five minutes, by a time of five minutes, the seizure is going to be prolonged. And the 30 minutes would be the, the time where the patient is going to get consequences of a longer lasting seizure, probably hypoxic damage, so on and so forth. So this uh, five minutes, I just, incorporated this slide is five minutes after if the if a seizure is going to last for more than five minutes so this particular uh, seizure is going to induce a cascade of activities inside your body in milieu interior releasing a lot of kind of you know cytokines 
um, mediators, neurotransmitters, so on and so forth. And the seizures would beget another seizure. The first seizure would beget, induce another seizure, and that particular seizure is going to induce another seizure after five minutes. That is why this five is very important. So when it comes to the etiologies, so etiologies, any etiology of any disease for that matter, we can classify as structural, genetic, metabolic, infection, immune inflammation, and or unknown. So when it comes to structural etiologies of a patient who is going to present with a convulsing uh, seizure, a convulsing status, you are supposed to think about traumatic brain injury, obviously non-accidental injury if the if the history is a little chaotic, if the history is a little vague, and you're supposed to think about space occupying lesions such as tumors, or it could be a cerebral malformation, which, has, which, which is there for a longer period of time. And there are certain genetic etiologies, I don't want to go into details, which could give rise to a state of sepilepticus. And metabolic etiologies like your hypoglycemia, hypo or hyponatremia, your calcium imbalance, hypocalcemia, hypomagnesemia can induce a seizure. And obviously, you are supposed to think about infections, immune and inflammatory uh, processes as the etiologies of this convulsing status epilepticus. Mind you, even though we talk about these etiologies, the, the known etiologies, there is a major cohort where we won't be able to identify what the exact etiology of the convulsing seizure is. And to begin with, it's always uh, airway and breathing, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. So airway and breathing, the child might present with a grunt, some sort of a breathing difficulty, uh, airway obstruction because of the spasms over the, the larynx with, the, with the, the motor activity, or it could be an aspiration of a foot bowlers or his own secretions. So if the child is grunting, if the child is having sort of a respiratory difficulty, you are supposed to think about the airway. Not supposed to think about, you are supposed to always, you are supposed to look into the airway always and the breathing. Circulation, so we are supposed to look into this, the circulation to see whether there is a bradycardia and obviously the hypertension, uh, the features of a raised intracranial pressure. And apart from that, the hypertension may be the etiology itself of this convulsing seizure. So kind of, you know, two ways of getting hypertension in a child who is having uh, a convulsing seizure. And D for disability. So you are supposed to uh, discuss or you are supposed to look into the posture of the child, could be a decerebrated posture or a decorticated posture, which is associated with this raised intracranial pressure. The child might be getting some dystonic reactions, and you might see some features of the so-called non-epileptic attack disorders or psychogenic non-epileptic seizures, or what we used to call as, um, uh, we actually, what we used to call as, uh, uh, pseudo seizures. We don't call it as pseudo seizures nowadays. However, when it comes to the management of the convulsing child, a convulsing status epilepticus, so you have just airway, breathing, circulation, and D E F G is just it's it's important to think about. If it's, it's important to identify, uh, or uh, it's important to investigate to see whether the eyes. Uh, glue derangement in the glucose so that is don't ever forget glucose so you are supposed to check the blood pressure start the blood pressure the blood glucose they were sorry about that blood glucose the capillary blood glucose and better if you could send a sample to the laboratory for a plasma glucose at the same time right right i think i don't need to mention about the the stabilization of the airway open and maintain the airway give high flow oxygen ventilatory support if necessary and it's important to maintain an euvolemia the child can't be hypovolemic the child can't be hypervolemic so euvolemia is rather the important when it comes to uh, any cns problem for that matter so you might have to give a fluid bolus 20 milligram per kg and that 20 milligram per kg should always be your 0.9 percent 
sodium chloride not never your never a hypertonic solution never a hypertonic solution and you might need to restrict the fluids if there is a necessity uh, only if it is necessary only if it is necessary because you are supposed to also know about this uh, cerebral perfusion pressure which is the difference between the mean arterial pressure and the uh, intracranial pressure so if you are going to reduce the mean arter arterial pressure by reducing the fluids the patient is going to be on the the uh, cerebral perfusion pressure is going to go down giving rise to a secondary cerebral damage a secondary maybe an ischemic damage for that matter right so we can give glucose if necessary i know that there is a special lecture on management management of hyperglycemia because of that i will be touching on that and managing the conversion itself so this is the algorithm given so we'll go one by one again to start with the airway your oxygen and you're supposed to think about the reversible etiologies like hypoglycemia maybe hyponatremia and raised intracranial pressure uh, in the in the beginning and it's try your level best to get a vascular access but don't be panic if you don't have the vascular access if you do have a vascular access you are lucky you can give intravenous midazolam they have given the dose to a maximum dose of 50 uh, uh, to a maximum dose of 10 milligrams and if you don't have uh, the vascular access again go for buccal midazolam i don't think that yeah we i think we can start with start from buccal midazolam or intranasal midazolam to begin with if there is any problem with, of giving buccal midazolam probably with clenched teeth or something like that you could think of giving uh, im midazolam if the if you can get this buccal access always try to start with buccal midazolam or intranasal midazolam for that matter so the dose is 0.3 milligram per kg and if you don't know the the kilogram body weight you might be knowing the way of calculating the body weight according to the child's uh, age i'm sure if not the bns gives the doses according to the child's age let's say for an instance till an age of six months 2.5 six to one year so according to the age they have given these uh, the buckle and the international midazolam doses so unfortunately, we don't have this buccal midazolam already prepared guns, which were available in which are available in um, the other countries. So we can use whatever the whatever the solution, the intravenous solution we have. So we are supposed to take the solution out through an insulin syringe, insulin needle, 27 gauge needle, and you can give it to either side of the buccal mucosa. So let's say for an instance, if the the, the volume is the volume taken is about around um, uh, 0.5 milliliters you can do 0.25 to the right sided buccal mucosa and 0.25 to the left side of the buccal mucosa and it's very safe and it's very easy so you can wait for five minutes after giving the first dose of uh, benzodiazepine if the patient is not responding you can repeat the same if you have the IV access, you can give the second uh, midazolam or the second uh, benzodiazepine as uh, an IV through the IV route. If you don't have the IV access, you can repeat the buccal or the intranasal route. However, by the uh, by, after the, the five minutes, try your level best to get a vascular access. So, if the patient is not responding even after even after the the, the the second dose of benzodiazepine so mind you we can give only two doses of benzodiazepine in, in any combination we could give diazepam 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 lorazepam if you have lorazepam or diazepam midazolam 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 any combination the maximum would be two do two doses right so if you don't uh, after giving two doses of uh, benzodiazepines you can you can think about uh, your phenobarbitone, levetiracetam, and phenytoin. I did start from phenobarbitone because levetiracetam is not freely available. IV levetiracetam is not freely available in Sri Lankan um, setup. Uh, of course, you can give phenytoin 
and phenobarbitone still is a good drug to be used in the emergency setup. So the levetiracetam dose is 40 mg per kg. Uh, we can give it very fast, probably over a period of probably over, over five minutes. And phenytoin is 20 mg per kg should be given always as an infusion over a period of 20 minutes under a cardiac with a cardiac uh, with a strict cardiac uh, monitoring because uh, phenytoin is a drug which has a notorious complication where the patient can develop cardiac arrhythmias and even though they have not mentioned not in the algorithm but i did mention the phenobarbitone dose this is how you are supposed to write the dosage in the the the, bed, the bht the bed head so it's 20 mg per kg of phenobarbitone diluted 1 in 9 with 0.9% sodium chloride. You're supposed to give it as a slow IV infusion over a period of 10 minutes. Right? Right. Right. So you, after giving, after giving uh, the, the, the second drug, that is phenobarbitone, levitaracetam, of any time you can wait for another five to ten minutes and if the patient is not responding it's better to liaise with the anesthetic team of course you can repeat the dose of phenobarbitone but that is the time that you are supposed to precautionary uh, inform inform the inform the anesthetist uh, because the child might need a rapid sequence induction and so after the seizure, you are supposed to monitor the airway and breathing, airway breathing and circulation, and monitor for further seizure activities. Because you might not notice this major motor activity, but the child might be jerking. The child might be having subtle kind of, you know, myoclonic jerks, maybe tongue jerks or eye jerks, eye blinking, fixed dilated pupils, or some sort of a motor activity which is not that uh, overt, not not prominent. Right? And consider about the underlying etiology. In the sense, if you think of uh, an infection, give IV antibiotics. Don't wait for your cultures. Don't wait for your uh, the investigations to come. But mind you, it's very important to take a sample for blood culture. The moment you put a cannula in, right? Not during the acute event, not during the acute seizure event, but try your level best to get a sample for your blood culture, which is very important if you are thinking of an infection. The, the, the complications of a convulsive status would start from, I would start from cerebral edema, intracranial pressure, raised intracranial pressure, maybe pulmonary edema, hypothermia, cardiac dysarrhythmias, hypertension and bradycardia, which is kind of, you know, which is a reflection of your raised intracranial pressure, myoglobin reuria, if the, if the conversion is that bad, the muscles can damage uh, with the rhabdomyolysis, your myoglobinuria, shutting down your uh, renal uh, renal filtration and disseminated intravascular coagulation. Those are all kind of, you know, rare complications, but you are supposed to know what the complications are. So if a patient has presented with irritability, irritability fever and rash, think about meningitis, not the common meningitis which we see day to day, that is meningococcal meningitis, which is rather rare, I would say, in the Sri Lankan setup. But fever and rash, the patient might be having a viral exanthem and a febrile status epilepticus. And as I, as I mentioned about the febrile seizures and febrile status epilepticus, mind you, febrile seizures are very common. We do see if you are doing uh, 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 and on call, you might get about say three, four febrile conversions on, on a single day, but febrile status epilepticus following a febrile conversion, a frank febrile conversion is rather rare. And a rapid onset uh, conversion, a status, a motor a convulsive status epilepticus, think about the poisoning, cerebral accident, Vague history, as I mentioned, always think about non-accidental injury, not rather uncommon. We might be missing a lot. Uh, hypertension, hypertensive encephalopathy, or raised intracranial pressure. So 
just to mention about the, the importance of measuring the blood pressure, because hypertensive crisis uh, uh, might, the presentation of a hypertensive crisis may be a seizure. So think about, uh, check the blood pressure, uh, 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 try to check the blood pressure as much as possible, right? Use the appropriate cups, cuff size and the, the, the blood pressure, the monitoring, the, the method should be correct. If not, you are going to get erroneous uh, figures and you are supposed to compare the blood pressure with the height and the, the age of the child. Not the, because with the age and the height of the child, the blood pressure is going to change. And the treatment of a systemic hypertensive crisis would again, the control of the seizure is the same. And you are supposed to liaise with, maybe with your nephrologist, maybe with your cardiologist, depending on the suspected etiology, and try to bring down the blood pressure, not a dramatic drop in the blood pressure, because mind you, if you are going to reduce the blood pressure all of a sudden, which is going to reduce the mean arterial pressure, reducing the cerebral perfusion pressure. So this reduction should be a gradual reduction and should uh, be always kind of, you know, get the help from a pediatric cardiologist, a nephrologist, or a senior pediatrician. And monitor your pupils and the visual acuity, not rather urgent, I would say, when it comes to the visual acuity, you can take some time. Right, I think that's it. So, any questions? Right. Right. So, how to give intranasal midazolam? So, intranasal midazolam, the dose is the same. I, I, I did highlight it. Uh, the, I did mention about this buccal midazolam or intranasal midazolam because the nasal mucosa might get a bit of a congestion with uh, the with the, the autonomic manifestation, the autonomic factors associated with a little bit uh, the ongoing convulsive seizure. So it's the the absorption might might not be that that dramatic, as not as good as of the buccal root. But in the same dose, you can give half half through the through the insulin syringe. So you are supposed to take the the needle uh, out, obviously, so off the needle, without the needle, you can use the syringe. Yeah. When in the other countries, they have these nasal preparations and oral guns. So we can use the, like same, huh? the same. The same. If a child comes with pre-hospital conversion for more than five minutes, is it rational to give non iv rule? Uh, so this is going to be the last uh, lecture on uh, management of asthma. Uh, I'm going to discuss about uh, status asthmaticus. Uh, yeah. Uh, first of all, I will discuss what is asthma. Then asthma is an inflammatory disease. Uh, it is characterized by uh, airway hyporesponsiveness and uh, bronchospasm and airway inflammation with mucosal edema and mucosal plug-in with uh, epithelial hypertrophy. Then uh, this uh, all these are get together and causes this bronchial asthma. In schematic schematic way, uh, the inflammatory this inflammatory process uh, uh, it is uh, going going around and uh, it causes uh, this asthma. It is inflammation, uh, it is airway hyperresponsiveness and airway obstruction ultimately give rise to symptoms of asthma. This is ultimately manifested as uh, clinical syndrome. Sorry. When we come to the status asthmaticus, actually it is uh, 
the progressive worsening of these symptoms, the progressive worsening of bronchospasms, uh, respiratory dysfunction and due to uh, in asthmatic patient, it is uh, actually it is unresponsiveness to uh, the standard conventional therapy and uh, this is progressive, it is antimetric and go into respiratory failure, even death, even progress to death and may need mechanical ventilation. Therefore, you know, it is uh, uh, the attack of asthma, it is going in uh, with, with uh, progression of disease towards uh, towards uh, respiratory failure, uh, which is unresponsive to conventional uh, reliever medications. Uh, one day, a uh, 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 cartoonist uh, has gone, got this uh, had got this uh, attack of asthma after recovering. Uh, he could remember the way at his style, uh, the way that bronchial asthma, bronchiolitis asthmaticus, how this was behaved, and uh, you know it. He 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 had the feeling that uh, this was uh, elephant on his chest. Then, then uh, therefore he uh, difficult to breathe, and especially difficult to breathe out, and uh, it is very tight test, and uh, how tight. Uh, it just so tight, and he he could remember it as an elephant was on his chest. That is uh, that's how he uh, he demonstrated his experience. Then uh, with this bronchial asthma, with without this Poisson's equation, we can uh, go. Uh, we can we we can dis discuss much about these things. You know that Poisson equation. If you go back to your LL physics, uh, then uh, you know you have uh, got this formula that uh, resistance is uh, in. Uh, it is uh, proportionate to uh, viscosity and length, and it uh, inversely proportionate to radius. Not just inversely proportionate. That uh, resistance is. Uh, in it is when we uh, it is inverse proportion radius and when we uh, increase uh, radius when we increase radius we have diameter uh, that uh, resistance pole by uh, few uh, more, more poles and uh, that means if we half this radius you know that it is uh, uh, radius is resistance is proportionate to both power of inversely proportionate to both power of radius. In other way, it flow is proportionate to both power of radius. That means uh, when we half our radius, uh, it is uh, it will increase resistance by 16 poles. That means uh, it, it is very important to, uh, important to uh, get this concept because if we uh, reduce our diameter the resist you know it will increase uh, resistance by many folds then when we reduce uh, this thing increase by many fold at the same time when we uh, increase our uh, radius that it will uh, it will uh, it will lead to reduction of uh, resistance by many folds that means this little bit of bronchodilatation is very important in the context of asthma because Asthma is uh, airway obstruction. Then there is that it, uh, it there, there is chest tightness because of this bronchospasm and uh, this restrictive type of disease. The, the restriction is there to uh, this air flow. To improve air flow, we have to reduce uh, resistance. To improve air flow, we have to reduce resistance by uh, to do this. Uh, if we if we can increase our uh, radius by two times, that uh, resistance will decrease by sixteen folds. That is very important. Then you can you can now you can understand that what is the important of uh, reduction of bronch uh, doing a bronchodilatation that redu to reduce uh, airway resistance. In other words, uh, it, it, uh, in the same way that if we, uh, resistance is there, then uh, if we can increase our radius, uh, it, will, it will lead to reduction of, uh, reduction of uh, resistance 
uh, then if we uh, increase by two folds it is 16 fold if we increase by four fold it will be 64 folds like that uh, by a little bit of increment of uh, radius will get a good results therefore a minute uh, bronchodilatation is very very important if it is even is very minute it is very important to get the ultimate results when we come to pathophysiology of uh, bronchial asthma and status asthmaticus it is uh, you know these secretions it is anyway it is it is the there is business of the this uh, business they are in our uh, uh, lumina business is in the lumina when we have secretion there is uh, such secretion there they are for reduction of uh, radius when we have epithelial hypertrophy again it is reduced our uh, lumina when we have bronchospasm again it constriction of uh, constriction of smooth muscles it lead to again reduction of lumina therefore in any way that if even secretions or even epithelial hypertrophy due to this inflammatory process and uh, even bronchospasm which causes uh, constriction of uh, bronch bronchiole and then uh, then it, it it ultimately lead to reduction of this uh this lumina therefore reduction of diameter will be uh, will be there therefore the reduction of diameter will increase our resistance by many folds then uh, here the in asthmatic airway there is some resistance because of reduction of this lumina in compared to normal airway there is in asthmatic airway there is some resistance in compared to uh, normal airway because there is reduction of lumina uh, in in attack therefore uh, huge secretion of this thing then there is uh, reduction of more reduction of uh, lumina therefore in in status asthmaticus there is more and more resistance because of more and more reduction of uh, airway lumina it it may due to secretion it may due to epithelial hypertrophy it may due to uh, bronchospasm uh, in is asthma actually uh, it all three of them I mean together uh, then in in therefore uh, you get this uh, attack and during this asthma you get uh, you get uh, wrong guy or you get mono uh, polyphonic wrong guy because of that because there is turbulent flow when there is turbulent flow you get uh, multiple sounds because of this uh, uh, dif different different uh, different different bronchial there are different different constriction therefore with the constriction there will be uh, lamina flow is lost here we get lamina flow in normal airway but in asthmatic airway you get turbulent flow because of this resistance uh, this uh, then it will it will give rise to this uh, wheezing sound but in wheezing sound here it in there is it is hetero you know it is heterogeneous this is in multiple steps there's multiple airway constriction therefore the the resistance will be different from different different airways therefore frequency will be different because uh, this uh, turbulence uh, will change therefore the according to the the constriction in different different parts you get different different frequencies therefore you get polyphonic uh, wheezing polyphonic wheezing or polyphonic bronchi polyphonic wheezing because of this different uh, frequencies but in uh, in other way if you have some obstruction to major airway due to some other thing rather than asthma like uh, either a string sick obstruction or the eccentric compression you get monophonic cronchi or monophonic wheezing because the frequency will not be changed uh, change because it is uh, un uh, single point obstruction but there is a multiple point obstruction your uh, frequency will be changed therefore you get polyphonic cronchi in uh, acute exacerbation of asthma uh, you, you can uh, divide into many categories uh, due to mild to mod mild or moderate type of uh, exacerbation it, it could be severe exacerbation or it could be life threatening exacerbation in uh, mild to moderate exacerbation of course in management wise you can manage at home or you can get the treatment at obt basis and go home then uh, in a severe and life-threatening episode you need admission 
that in management wise also different that you can you can that you can you can you should have institutional management for uh, severe and uh, life threatening asthma in mild to moderate asthma uh, that uh, the basic things are that the saturation maintain with without oxygen more than 92 in uh, room air and uh, respiratory rate is increased in all three things and uh, there is minimal use of uh, accessory muscles and minimal respiratory distress then uh, they, therefore in mild to moderate asthma uh, you can identify with uh, there is respiratory effort will be there increment of respiratory rate is there but there is no much distress and saturation is maintained without oxygen in cv asthma there is uh, anyway there is increased respiratory rate and tachypnea is there but you can't maintain uh, saturation and there is uh, uh, use of accessory, accessory muscles therefore it, uh, it is uh, significant usage of accessory muscles therefore you can see respiratory distress and there is uh, heart rate is increased in life threatening asthma again uh, it is there is saturation can't can be maintained because of this uh, this problem but for thing is here you can't see most of the time you can't see much respiratory effect because that child is exhausted and uh, wheeze may or may not be here because uh, because to hear wheeze you have to have some air flow without air flow you can't generate turbulent flow to have wheeze you have to have turbulent flow then you can hear wheeze but here life threatening asthma there is uh, bronco there's so much uh, bronchoconstriction therefore air flow is minimum or no air flow through bron uh, airways there, there is no air flow there is no turbulent flow. Therefore, you can't get uh, wheeze. That is the reason why you get you don't get uh, sounds or uh, sounds in uh, life threatening asthma. Or you say it is uh, it is life threatening asthma. Or you say it is silent chest. Then uh, other other way, the child is exhausted. Then uh, therefore, there is more more and uh, more and more hypoxia therefore uh, the child in cnsi other systems are affected cnsi is agitated or confused child may see their visible uh, cyanosis will be there then uh, in management in uh, exacerbation of asthma can be managed at home basis or can be managed at uh, opd basis then uh, some of things are can be managed should be managed at emergency department and uh, the few patients should be admitted and uh, should may send to icu even to icu in mild to moderate asthma mild asthma you can even you can manage at home with relief medications with uh, inhale uh, salbutamol inhale bronchodilators and you can manage at even at home if there is no improvement you can come to the uh, opd and get the treatment in then even then again in mild to moderate exacerbation you can send home after giving treatment but in uh, in acute cv asthma you have to admit to the the emergency department unit and there there we can do uh, in, in initial management if there is no improvement then we have to admit this child in there, because I am not going to discuss the mild to moderate asthma management here, but in in severe asthma, then we can uh, we can we have to manage at emergency department with with inhale bronchodilator. Then uh, with there we can give uh, inhale uh, salbutamol therapy, uh, uh, inhale salbutamol therapy, plus or minus. Uh, with with, ad, with addition of itratopium or without addition of itratopium we can uh, do back to back nebulization at at the emergency department then we can uh, we can go uh, go into uh, adding of itratopium plus uh, oral or uh, 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 steroid therapy and uh, further management data then we we'll, i'll decide, discuss uh, by, uh, step by step in further management i just put this uh, uh, side to show that you yeah, you have to decide which stage you are managing the first uh, in mild to moderate asthma you can manage that even at opd level then uh, then you can send home but in uh, further that in cv asthma we have to get to the emergency department and do further management 
then it, if it is failing those things we can have we have to act quickly and get uh, further step uh, by green iv therapy or uh, in in few percent few few number of patients even we can go into the icu uh, care as well in uh, when we get this uh, uh, instead of asthma ticket child, uh, you have to uh, first, first of all, you have to get this uh, IV access and general uh, in you know, some of the patient. If you are going to uh, admit this child, or you have to be, if you think that child is not responding to initial therapy, uh, you may get IV access. Then, uh, because uh, we may have to give further management and further, further care. Then, uh, then we we have to uh, we have to monitor this child continuously because this ill child. Then can manage monitoring is very important. Then uh, you may have to uh, connect this to uh, cardiac monitors and pulse oximeter. Then definitely you will have to get sex and uh, other monitoring. And then because of this ill child, you have to you have to have frequent monitoring uh, at least uh, till point where child get some improvement. Then definitely, uh, monitoring should be there. Then, uh, child, if we ch if child need uh, further requirement of mechanical ventilation or further management, the, the, then we, we may need uh, uh, catheter initiation and IV access, IV central line access. So those things. It is this general care. Actually, it is not uh, uh, that universal, but uh, according to the level that first we have to as a clinician, we have to decide which level of care this time we need. Then according to the according to needs, then we have to decide which uh, general care should be given. Then monitoring is very important for each and every child in the admitted to the emergency department. But uh, getting uh, inter intravenous access and other uh, other supportive management should be decided according to the level of care that we are going to produce provide. Oxygen actually uh, giving oxygen is very important because as soon as child get into the this thing in this child we should give oxygen then uh, there will be uh, weak mismatch in asthmatic children and because of this mucosal plug-in then there will be uh, there you, we as we discussed there is heterogeneous kind of disease there are uh, alveoli which are which are dilated alveoli which are collapsed. Uh, and there is a partially collapse, and there is my mucosa plug in and air trapping at uh, some of the parts. Therefore, there is huge amount of uh, mismatch of uh, ventilation. At the same time, there is uh, a problem with it and, and then circulation wise, there is circulation into the uh, in an unventilated part and a ventilated part. Therefore, there is VQ mismatch is there. Therefore, these children, uh, all, all these children should get oxygen. Uh, uh because the uh, few reason one thing is uh, hypoxia that would elevate uh, elevate the development of hypoxia and other way other other way we, when we when we give a treatment there there is uh, pulmonary uh, that uh, uh, bronchodilatation with the bronchodilatation with when some uh, some uh, some alveoli you know they are uh, hugely distended then we use the standard alveoli, but they are because of this uh, oxygen. You know that there is some diffusion capacity, but carbon dioxide, you know, it has enormous diffusion capacity. Therefore, a lot of carbon dioxide is uh, diffused into this distended alveoli. They are trapped. When we give a bonker dilatation, this trapped alveoli, which are filled with carbon dioxide, not with the oxygen, because oxygen absorbs and carbon dioxide filled with the carbon dioxide. Therefore, uh, it will release this carbon dioxide into adjacent airway because this is a bronchodilatation. Uh, therefore, we, we create hypercarbic state at this uh, this uh, locality. When we have hypocarbia, you know that when we uh, give the gas exchange, uh, when we increase carbon dioxide, there is reduction of all alveoli. Therefore, alveolar oxygen concentration will be reduced with the increment of carbon dioxide. With the increment of carbon dioxide, there is reduction of alveolar carbon dioxide concentration. Therefore, they are, uh, they, uh, they, uh, therefore, with, the, with this uh, increment of the carbon dioxide, there will be this decrement of uh, oxygen level. With the decrement of oxygen level, we create hypoxic environment uh, with uh, with this uh, phenomenon. Therefore, uh, target get more and more severe hypoxia or refractory hypoxia. 
uh, if we don't give oxygen. Therefore, giving oxygen is very important because of few things. One thing is you mismatch developing, uh, uh, developing this uh, hypoxic stage. Second one, uh, uh, there, is, there will be a uh, hypercarbia and developing a more refractory hypoxia with this uh, bronchodilatation. Third one is oxygen is uh, bronchodilated. Then if there is more uh, hypoxic state, there is a bronchoconstriction. Uh, more oxygen, they have a bronchodilatation. Therefore, giving a, uh, oxygen is beneficial. Therefore, each and every child who admitted to the uh, emergency department with uh, with asthma, with the uh, exacerbation asthma, we should give oxygen. Then oxygen, we have to give. Uh, we have to give oxygen few uh, with uh, with usually with uh, face mask with uh, with at least five liters. Around five liters of oxygen, five to six liters. Uh, we have to give a bit of a face mask, or even we can give with the um, uh, with the reservoir bag. We can give oxygen. Then uh, again, uh, as we discussed earlier, there, this asthma is heterogeneous uh, disease. Uh, therefore, uh, we have di different different parts with the different different. Uh, uh, bronch bronchoconstriction. Then some parts there is normal alveoli, some parts they are uh, constricted and collapsed atelectatic alveoli, some parts there is distended. Therefore, uh, distended parts will be there, collapsed part will be there, partially collapsed, partially uh, obstructed part will be there. There will be normal alveoli. Therefore, uh, the, the, this is important in one hand to give uh, then uh, to explain why we should give the oxygen. In other hand, uh, when uh, I will discuss it uh, later with uh, this uh, this uh, with the ventilator support. Actually, uh, when we when we apply pressure, they, it will apply different different way because when we apply pressure, if we go to ventilate, uh, then we apply pressure with uh, with the airway. Then the normal alveoli will get pressure. Actually, they are they are uh, they because they are open uh, open and uh, they get the pressure. Collapsed alveoli won't get pressure because if they are collapsed, the airway is collapsed. Uh, then uh, the distended alveoli won't get many things because it's already distended. Therefore, uh, they, when we give the ox, they, when we give the mechanical or the, uh, the the pressure that in, invasive pressure uh, that damage will happen to the normal alveoli. Then uh, it will not uh, cause damage to. Uh, Open uh, opening of the, it will not cause opening of uh, collapsed alveoli. It will not damage even uh, distended alveoli, but it will damage normal alveoli. Therefore, the the given uh, mechanical pressure will be detrimental in asthma. Therefore, we we uh, keep this uh, mechanical part of ventilation to the uh, as a last resort. Therefore, we should we should try to minimize mechanical ventilation, and we try we have to. Um, manage this asthmatic children without ventilation. Uh, that they, because there is this heterogeneous kind of disease uh, that several different different parts of the lung will have different 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 uh, bronchoconstriction. Therefore, pressure applied will be not uniform. It is uh, non-uniform application of pressure. Then uh, other thing is fluid. Actually, uh, this uh, asthmatic children usually dehydrated because they are high respiratory rate. Therefore, more uh, more evaporation. Therefore, uh, more and more evaporation. Therefore, uh, there is high uh, uh, the dehydration will be there. Uh, then uh, we have to give more oral intake and we have to manage water. But at the same time, we have to give appropriate fluid content because we should not overhydrate these children because uh, this will lead to wet lung and uh, more and more secretion into the airway. It will be, be, give another problem. Therefore, we have to give adequate hydration to these children. Then uh, corticosteroid and corticosteroid is a mainstay of therapy. You know that asthma is the inflammatory process. Therefore, the, we have to hold this inflammation. The, to hold this inflammation, we have to give uh, this. Uh, I have stated a uh, lot of action which can, can uh, do with this steroid and uh, uh, suppress cytokine production, suppress granulocyte microbiota colony stimulating factor, suppress uh, nitric oxide synthase activation. Then we have to we have to give all those things with uh, these things happen with inflammation. We have to hold this inflammatory cascade. 
to this whole this implemented cascade, the, the mainstay of therapy is corticosteroid. But the problem is the to uh, get this action, the corticosteroid will not give the action, immediate action. Therefore, it will it will take some time, at least uh, one and a half to two hours to get the action. Then, uh, then to get the maximum effect, it will take about four to six hours. Therefore, to, it will not get uh, proper action at immediately. Uh, therefore, we have to give uh, bronchodilatation to buy time to get the, this uh, corticosteroid attack. The corticosteroid, the mainstay of therapy, but, but just giving corticosteroid won't help because this is uh, asthma is uh, life threatening and uh, it is uh, actually the progressive disease. There are progressive respiratory failure. We have to hold this process. Uh, by support by uh, bronchodilatation and other things. At the same time, we have to do steroid. Corticosteroid, the main stay of therapy in bronchial asthma. In uh, what is the type of uh, corticosteroid? Actually, uh, the type of there uh, there are these things which we have to do either IV steroid or oral steroid. There is no uh, the action wise. There is no much change even give the IV or oral, but uh, in, in, in life-threatening asthma or uh, acute CV asthma, we usually child can't swallow uh, tablets or we can't give oral form of uh, uh, steroid. Therefore, at that case, we have to give uh, IV form. Otherwise, even oral form we, have, we can give, but in when we talk about the status that uh, life, uh, acute CV asthma and life In asthma, then we have to give uh, oral, uh, not oral, but the IV therapy. Then uh, inhaled corticosteroid actually uh, in again in uh, life threatening and acute severe asthma is limited, uh, limited, uh, uh, li limited therapy, limited access, but uh, limited uh, area. But uh, in in early that in mild or moderate exacerbation of asthma. Uh, actually, we can use a corticosteroid, especially MART therapy, that is maintenance and reliever therapy. That with the buprenorphine four meter combination, now uh, we can give MART therapy at early phase, that in mild and more, mild to moderate uh, severe asthma. Then uh, that is there in, in inhaled steroid therapy. Then it is a uh, lot of studies going on, but in uh, acute severe asthma and life threatening asthma, uh, then uh, we have to give IV steroid. And type of corticosteroid, there is no consensus. Actually, uh, we can, we, we can, what is the, we, there is no consensus to, to uh, say this is what is the best steroid, but uh, IV methylprednisolone is commonly used uh, in most of the people because uh, that maybe that uh, available uh, with, with the availability of uh, the available methyl uh, corticosteroid, that may be the most working one. But uh, um, that there is no consensus, but then we can give uh, uh, we we can give even IV methylprednisolone, IV hydrocortisone, IV dexamethasone, IV vitamethasone. That we can give a uh, lot these these things. There is no uh, consensus uh, between each other, but uh, uh, but uh, but in each, uh, here actually methylprednisolone commonly used uh, initial dose may be two milligram per kg followed by. 0.5 milligram per kg uh, every six hours. Then uh, main thing is we have to give this steroid till this inflammatory process is over. Till uh, till child coming out of this attack, we have to continue corticosteroid because it is a main stay of therapy. That is a main stay of therapy. Other things, other all those things are supportive. Then uh, to get this effect, I, we have already discussed that to get this effect, it will take at least uh, one to two hours to uh, get the effect, but it will take about six hours to get the maximum effect. Then uh, and uh, there are some side effects uh, like child may get hyperglycemia, hypertension, even uh, children might show some agi agitated children. Then uh, therefore some problem will be there, but uh, we have to, anyway we have to start steroid at first, and we have to we have to know what is the duration of. Uh, what is the timing we can get the steroid effect then uh, iv salbutamol uh, salbutamol actually there, there we can give iv form and as well as inhale inhale and even oral form is available but here in when we uh, 
when we when we get to the this thing uh, in uh, status asthmatic it is either it is IV inhale form or it is IV form that uh, it is you know it is beta agonist that there are a sympathetic effect with the direct bronchodilatation and with the relaxation of the smooth muscles of the uh, airways then uh, with uh, in status asthmatic uh, inhaler therapy that usual for inhaler MDIs uh, we have limited use but it is usually continuous nebulization. This we have to give continuous nebulization. The, mind you, it should be oxygen driven continuous nebulization. It should be oxygen driven nebulization. Without oxygen, we should not nebulize this patient. I have already discussed why, why we give oxygen with nebulization. Why we give oxygen? At the same time, we should not give without oxygen, we should not give nebulization at the same same effect that there is uh, bronchodilatation with the relative hypercarbia of the locality which will cause problems but then uh, will increase the problem therefore we have to give uh, oxygen driven nebulization then uh, we can we can give even iv uh, iv form iv salbutamol therapy and this we initially we can start one one mix per kg kg per minute then we can increase gradually and even in in ward setting in ward setting we can give one to four then we even icu setting we can go even up to ten uh, then uh, uh, there are the, the studies going on but it is fairly safe drug we can give uh, we, with what we have to give with careful monitoring monitoring is very very important then uh, with the salbutamol we can get a uh, uh, lot of side effects even si that, uh, that rhythm problems uh, tachycardia palpitation then we can get reticular arrhythmias then at the, uh, at the same time we can get hypo hyperglycemia and hypokalemia those things will be side effects then but uh, important thing is when we take this drug off it will gradually it, uh, we can we can see this effect will be going on then uh, magnesium sulfate is very good drug that it has a lot of effect but it is, it is bronchodilator dilated dilated effect that uh, you know it is cal calcium channel blocker and activation of uh, adenine cyclase with the smooth muscle relaxation will be there then there will be bronchodilatation because of the blocking uh, that holding of this uh, smooth muscle constriction at the same time it will in, in, improve this stabilization of muscles then uh, you know that it, with the with this status asthmaticus style will be exhausted therefore this lot, lot of respiratory muscle will be exhausted then there will be imminent respiratory failure then it will be, it will improve the uh, stability of these respiratory muscles therefore the, in, it is another advantage then uh, we can give this magnesium sulfate as a bolus uh, with uh, 25 to 50 micro per dose over uh, over the uh, 30 minutes then it, we can administer uh, do a set administration and in icu setting even we can give this uh, inclusion as well but uh, main thing is again we have to give continuous monitoring uh, though this has good uh, therapeutic index then it is not a very good therapeutic index but we have to give continuous monitoring therefore because they are they, they are uh, cases that is hypotension cns depression even muscle weakness then therefore we have to give good monitoring if you give magnesium sulfate but um, that we have to start magnesium sulfate early because if we, we know uh, this uh, uh, if you know this uh, nebulization and continuous nebulization fairly then if we can get uh, early uh, magnesium sulfate in it will be uh, good then uh, methyl xanthines, uh, you know, is aminophilin. Uh, then uh, it is again uh, the action is promotion of the relaxation of the smooth muscles. That uh, from that relaxation of smooth muscles, then uh, then there will be uh, bronchodilatation. At uh, uh, they, they are then at the at same time it, the people use this theophylline, but it is not used in uh, should 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 not be used in exercise or asthma. It is uh, different use. Uh, but uh, usually we uh, that um, am I feeling the IV form is the one we are using in acute CV asthma. Then uh, again, the problem is uh, there's narrow therapeutic index. Therefore, we have to get uh, bloating dose uh, and this continuous IV infusion. Because of this narrow therapeutic index, level should be monitored. 
therefore in sri lanka we should we don't have uh, facilities to do levels therefore uh, we we uh, that uh, some some of the centers we we are not using this uh, amateur film because of this uh, level issue because it has then uh, anticholinergic actually it is ipratropium uh, ipratropium uh, and uh, it it again uh, promote uh, bronchodilatation there are two forms uh, it, it, it given with this uh, uh, mdi and as well as uh, inhalation that in acute cv asthma it is actually inhaled form we can give uh, with the combination with the salbutamol or we can give alone but it it when we acute cv asthma it is better to give with the combination because we have to get uh, early effect then we can decide whether we have to give go to uh, magnesium sulfate or not uh, then therefore better to give with uh, combination with uh, alone with the uh, giving of this uh, steroid then again uh, again i i get remember i i am going to this because this up to now we discuss uh, increment of the uh, increment of the radius which leads to reduction of the resistance then uh, uh, then there are there are now uh, the, some some of the people are uh, are given that we can reduce the viscosity as well length of course we can't reduce uh, length is uh, same but uh, visco uh, the only two parts we can change one thing is uh, radius other one is viscosity viscosity of this uh, uh, for to reduce this viscosity people have used this uh, helium and helix then uh, reduction of this uh, fluid and uh, reduction of this viscosity there will maybe theoretically there will be increment of uh, air flow but uh, in in uh, by giving this helium and oxygen the low viscosity and re reduce airway resistance because of this uh, again Poisson's equation uh, but uh, with this uh, lot of studies and concurrent review there is it is not benefit clinically there is no benefit but uh, uh, it is again uh, remain that we know that there is no uh, the effect is uh, it is unproven effect then uh, if people a patient is not improving uh, then we have to see uh, what are the other problems that yeah then it could be either pneumothorax or even could be pneumonia that it even that in a significant infection especially the right low level pneumonia it will cause more more, more uh, gas exchange then if we uh, write low with pneumonia there will be some more uh, vq mismatch and uh, the, then uh, we it's infection may lead to more and more vq mismatch therefore there is no more improvement at the same time uh, there will be pneumothorax then you can you can uh, detect pneumothorax and you can relieve relieve, relieve relieve pneumothorax at the same time if there is no improvement you have to get this uh, proper history and see whether it is correct diagnosis at the same time you can get get a chest x-ray if there is no improvement here that in a chest x-ray uh, one of the child uh, is in the presented to the emergency department there there is uh, this child uh, there is uh, air trapping in the uh, left uh, left lung because there is uh, this child had uh, a history of uh body that Put particles going on and put uh, there's talking and uh, there is obstruction of this uh, left main bronchus causing a ball valve effect cause this uh, this kind of feature you know that there is uh, there is significant air trapping and uh, significant uh, expansion of left lung uh, because it can be uh, this is present as asthma we seen and exacerbation but here if we can reduce this thing uh, uh, but by giving this hassle, we can if we get this good history, you may you may tackle this part. If you can get this good history, you can tackle this part, and uh, in early phase you may uh, get this uh, uh, part out, and you you know this is not asthma, but it is foreign body aspiration that it can again can present as uh, as feature of bronchial asthma, but you that with the history and even clinical examination there is. Um, the discrepancy of clinical science by the term usually asthma is a universal that uniform disease that uniformly affected both lung will but here uh, it is mostly affected the right one there is uh, air trapping and no no air uh, breath sound in this part and there is a more breath sound in this part therefore uh, even some of the patient with asthma 
uh, with a small eye fit uh, can get by uh, different different uh, things especially for in body you have to remember small children in uh, invasive and uh, non invasive ventilation if there is failing of this initial this thing we may have to give uh, non invasive ventilation cpap or bypass but uh, that may prevent uh, application of tracheal intubation then we may we have tried to avoid uh, tracheal intubation and may, may try with uh, non invasive ventilation and uh, you know that in asthma there is different um, different different kind of vessel i have already discussed that uh, there's no uniform uh, vessel dilatation there are uh, different different part get the different different type of uh, bronchoconstriction therefore uh, it is not uniform some parts pull collapse some parts not fully collapse then uh, there are different 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 radial defect here you know that the airflow that it is normal alveoli you can get uh, usually get uh, uniform airflow but in asthmatics you get different different parts you get the different different airflow with different different collapses then uh, you should not you should because of this problem that mechanical ventilation should be uh, delayed as much as possible and uh, we we should keep it as a last resort but if there is uh, hypoxia uh, with despite uh, good oxygen good provision of high oxygen concentration and we have to consider with even giving with reservoir and all those uh, supports if there is hypoxemia then we have to consider then uh, it is uh, severe that going to impending respiratory failure and that absorption then there may be we have we may have to uh, uh, think about this and other one is altered mental status and cardio respiratory arrest then uh, if those things are there then we may have to think about uh, uh, ventilation, but it should be key to the last resort. Then uh, intubation of uh, asthmatic child is very challenging. It is the uh, most skillful person of this uh, team should attend to this thing because there will be a uh, lot of problems. Because one thing is, as we mentioned, there definitely there is you know, uh, problem with the aeration with the uh, heterogeneous type of disease then other one is uh, they can there is high risk of getting hypovolemia because uh, you know that uh, they are already distended uh, already in increased uh, uh, the uh, dehydration and low uh, intake and and then there will be with this with this all those bronchodilators are uh, vasodilators therefore there will be hypotension uh, by this time and uh, then other 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 thing is uh, there is uh, increase uh, we are trapping and therefore in intra intrathoracic pressure is increase in asthma with the air trapping therefore uh, venous return is anyway low then we give this uh, we when we give this anesthetic agent then we cardiac output therefore hypotension will be a problem anyway in uh, in status asthmatic then uh, when we give anesthetic agent in uh, to intubate there will more and more uh, vessel dilatation therefore anyway uh, hypotension will be developed then we give uh, again we give positive pressure when uh, when the intubation and uh, in in intubation there will be now further reduction of venous return they have further reduction of uh, cardiac output and hypotension therefore we should we should uh, be alert with hypotension then we may give uh, fluid bolus before uh, even before uh, ventilation and uh, we have to be, be very careful then uh, we should use cuff uh, cuff into tracheal because uh, we may have to uh, give higher pressure because you know it is high, yeah, trapping then we may go to counteract that we there will be uh, uh, phenomenon of auto peep development therefore we may have to give more pressure therefore we have to have cuff tube then we should do cuff tube other thing is there is a more and more risk of aspiration uh, therefore we have to use cuff tube and uh, fluid bolus then uh, we should, most skillful person individual in the team should attend to this intubation is most one of the difficult one 
then uh, drugs actually we should uh, avoid uh, morphine and also uh, tetragurium uh, then uh, ketamine is good agent to it is uh, good excellent agent asthma it is uh, it has long half life and has bronchodilatory effect and uh, and other thing is the vascular tone uh, the ketamine will uh, increase vascular tone and preservation of uh, hemodynamic uh, uh, hemo stability uh, with this uh, ketamine because ketamine is a good agent in uh, as an anesthetic agent in asthma then uh, to come into the last part of this lecture, uh, then we know that I have discussed different different parts and uh, from the emergency department to board setting, then to the uh, ICU department, and we have to act quickly, then we have to get, get good and correct decision and uh, correct time. We have to get good history, good examination to uh, pick up uh, the, the whether it is asthma, we, should, we have to make sure that we, we are dealing with asthma or whether we are dealing with something else. Then we have to pick this uh, uh, pneumothorax and other complications and uh, whether it is comorbidities like uh, asthma uh, or uh, in pneumonia, then we have to uh, uh, we have to detect those things as well. And uh, then uh, we have to act quickly and get the correct decision. We have to seek, uh, we have discussed with our experienced person, the seniors and as well as uh, we have to get the uh, discussion with, with that deterioration we have to discuss and get the correct decision then uh, at last uh, this uh, uh, we have to identify uh, status asthmatic as early because it is uh, we have to need prompt action therefore we have early identification is key in the management then uh, when we nebulize and uh, oxygen should be needed, the hospital should be given to all the children with need admission or all the spheres asthmaticus. And at the same time, if they are nebulization, it should be oxygen driven nebulization. Then uh, magnesium sulfate should consider early, uh, early, but uh, early and uh, ventilation should be kept to the last resort. The other thing is we have to monitor this, these are ill children therefore we have to be we have to be with these children uh, till get some improvement if there are some improvement then they are will be uh, improved we should, should, should not be with children at least till get some improvement then monitoring is very very important okay. thank you <coughs> okay uh, so thank you everybody i think this concludes the session today uh, and the next uh, pediatric session will be on 4th of October, uh, 4th of October, and starting at, uh, I think, 8, uh, 8 o'clock or 8.30. You have to look at the calendar. So thank you for joining. So we'll close the session. Huh? Right. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, yeah. Yeah, we'll, yeah, there will be PDA uh, uh, Genenops session on Monday. So we'll text you on your groups. So thank you, Sri Lal, sir, for organizing today's program. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Hello.